Trap More Gang. Today I am back with a very special, very exciting video for you guys. We are going to once and for all break down the entirety, the entire thing from top to bottom, sky to depths, the rap conspiracy iceberg people. That's right, in this video, this long ass extended, extendo little pump clip of a video, I'm quite literally going to break down to you every single rap conspiracy ever. At the very least, I'm going to give you a surface level explanation of every single conspiracy on the iceberg. I'm going to give you some backstory about what the hell it is they're talking about in this conspiracy. And I'm going to give you the info that you need if you want to go and look into these conspiracies a little bit more. Get your detective on, get your LA Noir on, you can go and do that. Now, in case you didn't know, the conspiracy iceberg or just the iceberg, these things have been floating around the internet like crazy recently. And it's basically just a whole bunch of conspiratorial random facts that get deeper more twisted, more confusing, more contrived as you get deeper and deeper in the iceberg until you eventually get to the deep dark depths of the ocean and you end up with some of the most ridiculous conspiracies in the game such as the Beyonce stem cell project or one of my personal favorites Dipset did 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen I have gone through this entire iceberg of rap conspiracies. I have found facts proof, debunking, every single thing that you could possibly need to know to understand everything on this iceberg and I'm going to break it down for you one by excruciating one. So trappers, trapaholics, trap nerds, trap geeks, all of that good stuff, we are going to get into this right now and decode once and for all every single rap conspiracy in the game. Illuminati confirmed. So the first conspiracy on the rap conspiracy iceberg is a simple one, it's the hip hop police. So this is the idea that in the NYPD there is actually a crack team of hip hop focused detectives that are actively pursuing rappers, especially in New York but also in other states and trying to take them down, trying to disrupt their activities, mess with their money, stop them winning basically. This is apparently a bit of a real thing but also a bit of a conspiracy. It depends how deep you want to go so let's have a look. So here's an article on Culture Hub, do the hip hop police exist? All you need to know about the NYPD rap unit. So the NYPD PD's Enterprise Operations Unit, also known as the Rap Unit, monitors hip-hop shows across the city. The task force makes a list of weekly rap shows and classifies them as either low, medium, or high risk in terms of illicit activity expected. The task force has previously monitored the likes of Remy Ma, 50 Cent, and yes, your boy Treyway, Takashi69. But don't get it twisted people, just because of the Treyway connection, the hip-hop police isn't a new thing. They have been going since the 90s. There's a very well-known former member of the hip-hop police known as Derek Parker. He's written a few books, done a few Vlad interviews, and broken down the history of the hip-hop police, dating all the way back to the 90s when they were apparently trailing Biggie Smalls, following him all the way to Los Angeles where he was unfortunately killed. The next conspiracy on the iceberg also does kind of relate to the surveillance of hip-hop artists by the police, because the next conspiracy is the the Wu-Tang FBI files. So this is the conspiracy or the idea that the FBI had an extensive file on the hip hop collective, the Wu-Tang Clan, and even at one point looking at the New York slash Shaolin based rap crew as a genuine criminal enterprise, as opposed to just a gang of New York boom bap rappers who like watching Kung Fu flicks. So here's an article from Vice breaking down some of the FBI's involvement in monitoring the Wu-Tang Clan. 
This says between 1999 and ODB's death in 2004, the FBI worked alongside the New York Police Department to investigate the Wu-Tang Clan for a wide range of federal crimes. They never actually filed any charges, but the FBI devoted substantial resources to the inquiry in an effort to take the Wu-Tang Clan down. In 2012, in response to freedom of information requests, the FBI released a 95-page file on ODB and the Wu-Tang Clan, making several inflammatory allegations at the crew, including drug dealing, ties to gangs, and even murders. Next up on the conspiracy iceberg is the Rick Ross staged shooting. Now this is the conspiracy that popped up a little while after wing-loving rapper Rick Ross was actually targeted in a drive-by shooting. Ross told police he slammed his Rolls Royce into this apartment building, dodging a barrage of bullets. To the surprise of many, not one round hit Ross or the Rolls, but peppered a number of cafes and boutiques along Las Olas. If there was only one shooter and he or she was in the suspect's car and there was no exchange of gunfire as we are led to believe, then how do you explain all the bullet holes in stores on both sides of the street, on the north and the south? At least one rival rapper believes it was all a publicity stunt. 50 Cent tweeting, ha ha ha, fat boy hit the building, LOL. It looks staged to me. So basically, Rick Ross was targeted at an intersection in a drive-by shooting, causing him to crash his Rolls Royce. However, the fact that the car wasn't hit by any bullets and the fact that some of the ballistics information seems a little bit conflicting, caused the likes of 50 Cent to clown Rick Ross and suggest that perhaps this shooting had been staged for clout in order to help Rick Ross continuing to purport his fake gangster image, even though we all know he used to be a CEO. Next up on the rap conspiracy iceberg is the idea that Eminem has been replaced. This is a story in this week titled Eminem was replaced by a clone in 2006. Now this theory has apparently been pushed by fellow rapper Tom McDonald who has rapped in lyrics suggesting that bone samples have been used to clone rappers. If you go and check out Tom McDonald's music video for the track Cloned Rappers, you'll see the music video has Tom McDonald kind of playing the role of Eminem being cloned. He also says in the song that Kodak Black, Gucci Mane and Eminem have all been cloned. This is what I would call conspiracy capping for clout. Next up on the conspiracy iceberg, it's the B.O.B. Flat Earth Society. Society. Because if you didn't know, formerly relevant rapper B.O.B. in 2017 started thinking about the Earth the same way as his career progression, leaning heavily into the false conspiracy theory that the Earth is indeed flat, appearing in several media outlets, pushing his crazy new beliefs, and even attempting to raise funds to check if the Earth is flat. If I was B.O.B., I'd stop worrying about the flat Earth and just focus on raising funds to get myself a down payment on a flat. Next up, we've got a big conspiracy theory from the iceberg, and that is the idea of gangster rap prisons. This is a long-running hip-hop conspiracy theory that suggests that decades ago, the rap, music, entertainment, media, industry all met secretly in a big clandestine meeting, agreeing to work together with the prison and corrections industry to create and promote violent rap lyrics that will cause people to commit crimes, ultimately sending them to jail and making profit for the prison and record industries. Now, this relates to another conspiracy that we're going to get into later on in this video, but essentially this all relates to one big secret meeting when the record industry and the prison industry all met up together and decided to get a little synergy going on. Our next conspiracy theory is that the LAPD shot Biggie Smalls. This kind of relates to the previous point about the hip hop police who were known to have followed Biggie Smalls from his native New York under surveillance to Los Angeles, which kind of fits in with another theory that the police actually witnessed Biggie being murdered due to the fact they were running surveillance on him, which has even led some to assume that the police may have had something to do with murdering Biggie, with this theory suggesting that it was the LAPD themselves responsible for the assassination. With this Sun article suggesting that Biggie Smalls was killed by dirty cops and the LAPD have covered up the crime. These allegations are actually stemming from a documentary that was made, Suge Knight and the Murders of Biggie and Tupac, where investigative journalist Nick Broomfield made suggestions that the LAPD might have had something to do with Biggie's murder and made efforts to cover up what they knew about Biggie's death in order to avoid retribution. Our next conspiracy is the idea that the rap group 3-6 Mafia are in fact a bunch of Satanists. I mean, this one isn't too much of a stretch. I mean, 3-6 Mafia quite literally means 666 Mafia. It is a reference to Satanism and devil worship. But whether or not I think Juicy J and DJ Paul are actually hailing Satan is another question. But this OK Player article breaks down some key points where Satanism has actually influenced hip hop over the years with reference to 3-6 Mafia. Here it says 3-6 Mafia founding member DJ Paul agrees there is no 3-6 without Satan. 
we were into horror movies and serial killers. It's more like a character, I would say, Robert De Niro playing the devil in Angel Heart or Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate. Paul was raised in a religious family, but 3-6 Mafia gave him a chance to explore his darker tendencies, to tell his real life story of chaos and violence through his love of horror. Satan worshipper or thug would be my profile, read my file, I've been a mean child for a while within a mystic style. In fact, during the 3-6 Mafia hit song Stay Fly, this spawned a bizarre conspiracy theory as during the chorus, a woman sounds like she's singing You Are God, You Are King, Lucifer, and a number of forums popped up dedicated to the theory, despite the fact that it has since been debunked. Next theory, one of my favorites, is that Drake is an industry plant. Now this is a conspiracy theory, but in some ways you could argue that this is sort of, there's a, there's a chunk of truth to this. If you didn't know what an industry plant is, this is also a kind of semi-conspiratorial phrase that suggests that the industry just decides that a new artist is the next person that they want to promote and they make them into a star rather than them growing organically, building up a genuine fan base of people that like their music. Record labels basically just plant them in the industry and turn them into a massive success. However, the conspiracy for this one gets a little bit deeper. Here's a box dem forum post with the title, Drake is an industry plant who started his soul snatching career by mimicking Joe Budden. This basically says that Drake is an industry plant who just stole his style from anybody who was popular in music at the time. He mimicked Joe Budden, then he became Trey Songs, then Lil Wayne, Chris Brown to Big Sean, then he started snatching souls of small time artists and trying to hinder their careers. The Weeknd, Quentin Miller, I Love McConan, Party Next Door, and even The Migos. He tried to get close to J. Cole by buying his CDs on some, you need all the help you can get, you owe me now shit. Female artists aren't safe either. He snatched the soul of a dead Aaliyah. Sometimes he thinks he's the next Rihanna or Nicki Minaj. Sharing this clip saying, does this even look like a real rapper to you? Come, let's do it. I'm tired. Well, I'm more tired than you. So what's up? You didn't get your sandwich. No. Okay. Should talk about it? No. <laughs> get out of here. I didn't get my sandwich. I was looking forward to a nice tuna sandwich on a bagel. Oh, tuna. I do eat tuna. I clearly said, hey, can you please get me a tuna sandwich? I thought you were kidding, because you don't Oh, like yeah, because you don't I definitely like pull a joke, joking about a tuna sandwich that I wanted. I'm just a regular comedian over here. Look, there's no proof that Drake is an industry plant, but at the same time, I mean, who gets more resources and a push and just a big old pat on the back from the industry than Drake in this day and age? The next conspiracy on the Berg is that Tupac is still alive. Now, I actually have covered this extensively in an April Fool's video that I made around a year or so ago called How Tupac Faked His Death. In this video, as a joke for April Fool's, I kind of took all of the little conspiratorial little clips, fake news reports, fake photographs that seem to suggest that Tupac was still alive and put them together as if they were the genuine story of how Tupac escaped the country and fled to Cuba and is still living his life out in comfort there. This this isn't true, this is a conspiracy, which I admit, I've played my part in pushing out there even further. So following on from Tupac still being alive, it's the next conspiracy theory in the iceberg, which is the seven day theory. Now this actually relates to Tupac's first posthumous album under the name Machiavelli, the Don Caluminati, the seven day theory. And there's actually a ranting blog trying to break down the seven day theory on angelfire.com saying the recurrence of the number surrounding Tupac's death is called the seven day theory. This theory states that Pac will return to us seven years after he left, which would be September the 13th, 2003. Whoops. Tupac died at the age of 25. Two plus five is seven. Tupac was shot on September the 7th. Tupac survived the shooting through the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and died on the 13th. Seven days! Official time of Tupac's death was 4.03 p.m. Four plus zero plus three is seven. The outlaws consisted of seven members. In the video, Toss It Up, Tupac breaks a mirror at the very end of the video, which is seven years bad luck. Are you Still Down was released on November 25th, which is not only the age of his death, but also two plus five is seven. Tupac's birthday is on the 16th, one plus six is seven. In the intro of Machiavelli, seven day theory, there are six gunshots going off, but when the song starts, there is the seventh. Tupac died on Friday the 13th, I could go on and on and on. Apparently Tupac was gonna come back, and this is the seven day theory. He, maybe he was gonna come back, be resurrected like Jeebus on day seven after his resurrection. Maybe it was seven years, or maybe it's just one giant 
an L because it's a conspiracy theory that isn't true. But then again, let's not forget what an L is upside down. It's a seven, baby. Now, the next conspiracy theory is a fan favorite. This is that DJ Vlad is indeed the FBI. DJ Vlad of Vlad TV is a hip hop staple. DJ Vlad and his Vlad TV channel are probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest and largest voices in the hip hop media scene. DJ Vlad has interviewed anybody who is everyone and often that does lead to him speaking to people about their past in crimes, the streets and the murky criminal underworld. And the fact that Vlad is so good, he's such an amazing interviewer that he can get all kinds of people from all different backgrounds to open up about the dark things that has happened to them. Well, unsurprisingly, that has led many people to call DJ Vlad an FBI informant because of the fact that he often has people from the streets up onto his show for an interview and sometimes they say incriminating things that they have gotten up to. That's not Vlad's fault. If you want to say something incriminating, that's on you and you shouldn't. If you've done crimes, give it to yourself. But that hasn't stopped a whole bunch of idiots and conspiracy theorists on the internet saying that DJ Vlad is indeed the police or a card carrying member of the FBI. And one of the biggest catalysts of this are both the cases of Casanova, where fans on Twitter have blamed his exceptional interview with DJ Vlad for the fact that he got caught up in a massive Rico case, as well as the fact Philly rapper and former drug kingpin A.R. Ab even had to come out and defend DJ Vlad after so many people suggested that Vlad's interview with A.R. Ab played a role in A.R. Ab getting a large sentence. But even A.R. Ab himself came out to say specifically that Vlad's interview had nothing to do with him getting locked up. Now this next one, the real 50 Cent, I had no idea about this until I started researching this iceberg and this one caught me by surprise. This is the idea, this is true, that there's actually another dude who went by 50 Cent. This guy is actually a New York gangster from the streets of the Bronx and his life and death in the mean streets that rapping 50 Cent grew up in ultimately led to Curtis Jackson to be inspired by the original 50 Cent Kelvin Martin. Apparently Martin was actually known as 50 Cent due to having a reputation of being prepared to rob anyone regardless of how much money they were carrying at the time. He will quite literally rob you for a pocket full of loose change and be quite happy walking away from the drill with 50 cents. Now unfortunately he was shot on October the 20th 19th in the stairway of his girlfriend's project building in the Albany Projects, later dying in Kings County Hospital four days later. Julio Wimo Akevdo was actually convicted of first degree murder and served a decade in jail for the killing of the original 50 Cent. Battle Rap Illuminati, now this is kind of a dumb one. I think I, I, I tried to get my head around this one and I'm pretty sure this is sort of a bit more of an inside joke conspiracy relating to this video that just has a whole bunch of little quick cuts and jokey parts of different battle rappers in different battle rap leagues talking about Illuminati stuff, reacting to Illuminati stuff. I couldn't really find out if there was a real conspiracy behind this or if this was just a reference to kind of the, this video and these, these battle rap leagues. When I saw battle rap Illuminati, it made me think, oh, maybe there's some kind of covert clandestine Illuminati that's somehow controlling and influencing the battle rap communities. I did find this book on Amazon called Sacrifice, Magic Behind the Mic, The Conspiracy Behind Rap Music and the Illuminati Manipulation of Hip Hop Through Occult Symbols. I wasn't sure if that kind of related. Maybe battle rap has been used by the by the Illuminati to influence the minds of the youth, especially the kind of twisted lost youth youth that are into battle rapping. I don't know. But ultimately, the biggest proof that I found of this was this Illuminati battle rap shit video, which wasn't very entertaining, wasn't very compelling, but hell, it kind of makes sense. So I didn't know time for any crime, but that's just the difference between a street nigga and a bug. Don't get it confused. <laughs> Wow, the stage collapsed. Illuminati confirmed. All right, this next one is an absolute classic. MF Doom body doubles. In case you didn't know, the metal-faced rapper MF Doom was prolific for sending imposters, fake MF Dooms in the mask, but not really him, to concerts, to shows, to gigs and bookings, taking the bag and giving promoters just some random fat guy wearing an MF Doom mask. A genius finesse, one that many fans that at least weren't being duped by a fake MF Doom thought was kind of funny, but at the same time, this is kind of a screwed up Thing to do and there's actually a few kind of sad accounts of organizations venues that actually ended up being ripped off by mf doom who sent an imposter to play shows and here's one of them that i'm going to read you now to everyone who came down to our live in doom event on saturday and are questioning whether that was the real
Imperial Doom, we are in the same position as you. We had a legitimate contracted gig from his official booking agent and we were in contact through the entire booking process with his management and label. As far as we were concerned, the real Doom was going to appear. We received news from Doom's management on the morning of the gig that Doom wanted more money or he wouldn't show up. The show was done and intended as a very special and intimate show which wasn't about making money. As we wanted this show to go ahead and was left to ransom to this extortionate request, we agreed to this even though it was a breach of our agreed contract and in hindsight we should have cancelled the show then and there. At 9.30 we had just opened the doors and we were told by management that Doom would appear but he wouldn't DJ and he was just going to sign autographs. We said this was unacceptable, we had agreed and paid for a DJ set. 10 minutes later we received a call saying he would DJ or at least that's what we were told. Many people in the venue noticed there was a very strong possibility that the person that was finally sent down was not Doom himself. We paid the fee up front to Daniel Dumoulet's bank account and have the receipts to prove this. We will be seeking legal advice and are doing our best to get his show fee refunded from Doom and his management and we will then take suitable steps after this action. Basically MF Doom was a known fraudster. He was really shysty. He was sending fake MF Dooms to gig to go and do fake performances so that he could pick up the bag sitting around from the comfort of his own slippers at home. Over the years people have theorized as to why MF Doom would do this, how he is even able to get away with this. There was actually this one article on hotnewhiphop.com titled why MF Doom is allowed to use imposters on stage. Now this goes into detail and points out other artists that have been accused of using body doubles over the years including Kendrick Lamar and ASAP Rocky with the article going on to describe an adult swim performance that was supposed to have MF Doom perform with a fake being sent out on stage who ended up being legendary comedian Hannibal Burris. Now apparently sending out a famous comedian instead of Doom went down pretty well with this crowd but as somebody that has actually seen the real MF Doom perform live many years ago I would say that there is truly no substitute for the metal faced villain. But that said now that he's passed away why stop? I mean he didn't mind using imposters for shows when he was still alive. Shit the way record labels exploit dead rappers now I'm surprised the fake MF Doom isn't contracted to do a hundred City World Tour right now. Jay-Z time travel. Now this one is pretty jokes. I actually saw this photograph on my recent video about whether or not Jay-Z is in the Illuminati and it definitely tickled my sight because a photo of a black man from the 1930s has been circulating for quite some time and because this man bears such an uncanny resemblance to Jay-Z many have suggested that Jay-Z is indeed a time traveler. I mean just look at it man it looks like Jay. I'm trying to hear that reasonable doubt harpsichord edition. So there you have it chapter one done. Our easy sky conspiracy theories are all in the bag and it's now time for something deeper as we slide our way down to the tip. Pause. So a fitting first entry for the tip is the Easy e AIDS needle. So this is the idea that apparently during the famous dispute between Easy e of NWA and Suge Knight of Death Row Records, there's a conspiracy that suggested that Suge Knight took a needle infected with the AIDS virus and used it infecting Easy e with that virus that would eventually take his life. So there's an article here from High Snobiety called The Conspiracy Surrounding Easy es Death. This says that in a 2011 interview with Hip Hop DX, rapper B G Knockout said, I believe in my heart that somebody did something to Easy e saying for a person to have full-blown AIDS that quickly is suspicious. Saying he had a part brother whose father died from full-blown AIDS from sharing a needle and that it took him much longer to succumb to the disease than Easy e Suggesting as well that somebody suffering AIDS would kind of get episodes of being sick. He suggested he was around Easy e for the last three years of his life and never observed him having any kind of episode like that. Apparently Jerry Heller also expressed suspicion that Easy e would get so sick and pass away so quickly and apparently Lazy Bone told Angela Yi that Easy went in for the common cough or pneumonia in January and then by February was HIV positive, then by March had full blown AIDS and then was dead. Apparently Easy es children that were born after he passed away weren't positive and even their mothers weren't positive. Nobody was positive. So Easy es death was called suspicious and likened to the killings of Tupac and Biggie, which is where Suge Knight comes into the picture. And Suge said something very incriminating in a Jimmy Kimmel appearance way back in 2003 that had many people suggesting that he might have had something to do with Easy es death because he said that killing people the traditional ways of shooting etc leaves too much evidence behind and that the smart thing to do is to prick them with a needle that has AIDS on it, suggesting that this is something that had been done to Easy e See, right. technology is so high, right? Right. So if you shoot somebody, you go to jail forever. So the kids, you don't want to go to jail forever, right? right? So they got this new thing out that people sell them all the time. They got this stuff to call, they get blood from somebody with AIDS, 
Yeah. And it shoots you with it. Oh, so well, that's that seems bad. That's yeah. a slow death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Easy, easy thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Wow. Next up, it's a simple conspiracy. The idea that Biggie Smalls predicted 9-11. And this all relates back to one very simple lyric in the track Juicy, where Biggie famously said, time to get paid blow up like the world trade. Now, since the September 11 attacks in 2001, many people have suggested, oh, Biggie Smalls predicted what happened to the World Trade Center. But in actual fact, he was referring to another explosion that went down at the World Trade Center back in 1993. This was a pretty well-known incident. Of course, Biggie Smalls had absolutely no forewarning of the 9-11 attacks, let alone having any kind of involvement in them. The next theory on the list is the Kanye MK Ultra theory. This relates to a top secret CIA experiment called Project MK Ultra, which related to mind control, specifically the use of drugs like LSD on human subjects in interrogation for the purposes of brainwashing or psychological torture. But more generally, in terms of this conspiracy, it's the mere suggestion that somebody maybe has been brainwashed by the government or is kind of waking up from a brainwashing or has somehow had their thoughts controlled or altered. And this conspiracy basically suggests that Kanye West has in some way been subjected to mind control experiments or he's had his mind controlled in the past and perhaps his erratic behavior in public is either an example of this or an example of him breaking three of the mind control and finally getting control of his mind back. With this theory being supported by several social media clips of Kanye speaking publicly. I just want to talk about mind control. You know when people try to influence you through social media and try to tell you what to do, or if you post something that's like positive on Instagram and it gets taken down, if it's not a part of a, a bigger agenda, you know, that's like mind control. That's the echo chamber. That's trying to control you based off of incentivizing you and based off of you getting enough likes. And that's the, the poison that's happening with social media. And, you know, for me, you know, I just got back my IQ scores and they were Mensa level, 133, 98 percentile, like straight up Sigmund Freud, Tesla vibes. Straight up Sigmund Freud, Tesla vibe. Gotta tell me what to do. I feel like they're touching my brain. Like for a woman, she doesn't want nobody to, she wants to be in control of her body and choose who she wants to give it to. And no one can come up and touch it or, or take it or tell her what to do with it. It's up to her what she does with it. So I feel like that with uh, my mind. Well, look, we can listen to Kanye talk nonsense endlessly, but you get the idea. And next up in the conspiracy iceberg, it's the Busy Bone Possession Tape. Now, Busy Bone is a rapper and the youngest member of the rap group Bone Thugs and Harmony. A video has been circulating that many have said online seems to show Busy Bone possessed or in the grips of some kind of supernatural possession, which we'll take a look at now. You know what I mean? That gotta come from the heart, man. If it don't come from the heart, I don't even wanna hear it, man. Oh, man, bootleg it or something. I ain't trying to hear none of that, man. Keep it real, it don't even come near me. Don't come around me don't buy nothing it don't matter to me that's how i get down it's real when i see you you already know how i feel about you and i'm gonna see you regardless see who everybody we're talking to everybody man yeah because you know we're not just talking to each other we're talking right. to a lot of people around the radius so Busy Bone's erratic behavior in this interview has been suggested by many as him being possessed by some sort of demon, though I would probably wager that he is most likely possessed by some sort of crystal meth. Next up is rap.mp3, a suggestedly haunted mp3 audio file that has floated around the internet and hip hoposphere for many years. Now there's actually a Reddit thread related to this hip hop conspiracy iceberg with people asking what the hell rap.mp3 is, with three explanations being offered in the comments. The first theory is that a missing kid's phone was found and it only had one audio file on it, which was rap.mp3, and the track apparently had secret codes, subliminal messages, or maybe induces suicide to anybody who listens to it. The second theory is that rap.mp3 is a 13 second audio file which all rappers use subliminally on their albums to manipulate the listeners. And the third theory suggests that there's actually eight songs by eight different bands with each song narrating directly or indirectly the murders committed by each of the members of each band. The negative energy caused by these murders was found within each of the songs. Now this is actually a theory that we're going to get into later on, but the idea of the Memphis rap sigils actually refers to a handful of kind of haunted or eerie projects that were put out by hip hop artists in Memphis, and I would wager that rap.mp3 perhaps is a digitized reference to some of those earlier haunted Memphis rap songs. 
Next up, we have a classic rap conspiracy, which is the curse of the bass god. If you don't know, the bass god refers to legendary bass rapper Lil B, the game-changing Bay Area rapper whose style is focused on positivity and being yourself, as opposed to negativity, gang banging, drug use, all that whack stuff. But it's not all positivity from Lil B, because Lil B was famously known for putting curses and hexes on people that he didn't like, specifically athletes competing against his favorite teams, including Kevin Durant who Lil B famously put a curse on, with Lil B's tweet seemingly confirming that the curse had indeed been a success, blocking Kevin Durant from going to the finals. Apparently Kevin Durant had earlier tweeted about Lil B's music, saying it was unlistenable. After being called out by KD on Twitter, apparently Lil B challenged Durant to a one-on-one -on -one game of basketball, an idea that was entertained for a while, but ultimately ended up fizzling out, leading Lil B to take drastic action. With Lil B announcing on Twitter that because KD had said that Lil B was a whack rapper, he had officially put the base gods cursed on Kevin Durant. Since this incident, Lil B has actually gone on to curse other athletes, including James Harden. The base god's curse on Kevin Durant lasted for years, with Lil B even taking to ESPN in person and in a dress to discuss his curse dishing out behavior. So we're gonna play a little game called Cursed or Not Cursed, and we've got four NBA players who have crossed you in the past, and you'll tell us if they're currently under what is that? a curse. <laughs> That's not, we're not playing that, that just happened. This is real. Know. Oh. All right, so when Kevin Durant called you trash in 2011, you tweeted, Kevin Durant will never win the title after he said Little B's a whack rapper. Hashtag the base god's curse on Durant. Oh boy. Is KD still under a curse? Oh yeah, KD's curse is active. He's Ooh. still cursed. Until he plays <laughs> me in the game of 21. I'm getting the chills. He has to play you in the game of 21? He has to play me in the game of 21. That's the only way the curse can be lifted. And, okay. and did you make the stipulation? After the curse to lift it or is this the reason there is a curse that's the reason there is a curse because Kevin Durant actually agreed to play me in the game of 21 mm -hmm. during the season he went back on his word and that's when the base guy was like you know what curse him 6 9 is an FBI informant now look we all know that 6 9 snitched on the Treyway Bloods the nine Trey Bloods from New York that he had become a member of pretty much for clout as part of his insane run to the top but what not a lot of people know is that there is a crazy conspiracy theory floating around the internet that 6 9 had been an informant for the FBI the entire time. Dating back to 2017, theory goes that 6 9 was sent in undercover to infiltrate and take down the 9 Trey Gangster Bloods, I assume by the hip hop police. Several rappers and other people have gone on to suggest that 6 9 was indeed an informant the whole way through and was probably snitching the whole time. Meanwhile, other YouTube videos exist on the topic, making the suggestion that 6 9 was a rat all the way through. This includes Nick Cannon, who also has put it out there that 6 9 was most likely an FBI informant from the very start back in 2017. The Rock Rockefeller body count. Now this one I couldn't find too much on, but essentially my assumption is that the Rockefeller body count is kind of a little bit similar to the Clinton body count, but for Jay-Z and Dame Dash. So the Clinton body count is a conspiracy theory that Bill and Hillary Clinton had had numerous people suspiciously whacked and murdered during their reigns as president and first lady respectively. This suggests that Bill and Hillary have assassinated as many as 50 people or more. Now I couldn't actually find any solid evidence or proof about the any supposed Rockefeller body count, but there are several different theories linking the Rockefeller empire to crime or the shady criminal underworld. Rockefeller co-founder Kareem Biggs Burke ended up being indicted as part of a weed conspiracy theory where he was charged as part of a conspiracy to traffic apparently thousands of kilos of marijuana around the United States. Furthermore, we know that Jay-Z shot his brother when he was 12, so he is no stranger to getting busy with those glocks. And of course, who could forget Kanye West's crazed onstage rant where he told the entire world that Jay-Z has killers on deck. I've been sent here to give y'all the truth. Jay-Z, call me, bro. You still ain't call me. Jay-Z, call me. Hey, bro. Jay-Z, I know you got killers. Please don't send them at my head. Just call me. Talk to me like a man. Next conspiracy theory is the Rothschild record label. At first glance, you might think that this is some kind of Illuminati-focused record label created by the secretive Rothschild family, who we all know low-key control the global banking markets or some sort of bullshit. The Rothschild family, 1700s, doing big things. But the reality of the Rothschild record label isn't that they're secretly pulling the strings of the record industry like the secret Illuminati family you would think they are, but the reality of the Rothschild record label is in fact much less glamorous. 
Ghost. This is in fact a record label started by one of the young heiresses of the Rothschild fortune, Kate Rothschild, a story which we're going to elaborate on later on in this iceberg video, but essentially all signs point to Kate Rothschild setting up this record label so she could have a frisky rump with woke American rapper Jay Electronica and I assume business expense the whole fiasco. And in the end it seemed like the Rothschild record label was indeed a gigantic L after the relationship between Kate Rothschild and Jay Electronica ultimately fell apart, as too it seems did the record label, which still in September of 2014 apparently owed over £365,000. Next up, the Kodak Black clone. Now recently, since being released from prison by Donald Trump, much like many other rappers before him that are released out of jail and have to face cloning rumours, Clone Dak Black was no different. The rumours apparently started after Kodak was released from jail following his presidential pardon, with many people noticing that he was significantly skinnier and rocking longer hair than when he went in jail. And obviously the first thing that comes to mind when somebody who's been in prison for a couple of years has longer hair and is skinnier is of course conspiracy theory and cloning. Eventually, tired with all of the cloning accusations, Kodak would eventually take to Instagram to respond to the allegations and deny being a clone. Why this don't sound like Kodak? What the hell? So who I sound like? All this little clone shit starting to make me mad, huh? You know what I'm saying? See, back then, all my, my other little bits, whenever this little clone shit came out, I wasn't really tripping on them, but now y'all, y'all blowing me now. How the fuck it can't be them other, a nigga can't uh, motherfucking duplicate this shit. All kind of niggas be trying to imitate this shit, but they can't duplicate this shit. I need fuck niggas ain't seen yet. Next conspiracy theory is that Your Old Droog is Nas. So Your Old Droog is a rapper from Brooklyn who first started popping off around 2014, releasing a debut EP that got a lot of attention because of the way his voice sounded. In fact, Your Old Droog sounded so much like Nas that Reddit threads started popping up saying that Your Old Droog was Nas, or that this was some kind of new alter ego for Nas to be rapping under. This of course turned out not to be true, and eventually things would come full circle when Nas would respond to the Your Old Droog rumors himself. Apparently Nas was confronted in an MTV interview being asked about a secret Nas album to which Nas replied, what do you mean a secret Nas album? I have no idea what you're talking about. To which they replied, just for the record I had to ask you Nas, so you didn't put out a secret EP? To which he replied, who me? I don't even know what that means. No secret EPs. I don't want a secret EP. I want you to know it's me when I drop. And over time it seems that fans have abandoned the absurd idea that Nas is your old Droog as well as your old Droog himself. Next conspiracy theory is that Gucci Mane died in jail. Yes, when Gucci Mane was in jail quite some time ago, around 2014, an internet hoax began to circulate suggesting that Gucci Mane died of heart failure while still in prison. This said the report was made that the rapper was found dead in his cell with doctors suspecting that it was heart failure, while other reports suggested it was a drug overdose due to extensive scissor use. This of course naturally turned out to be completely untrue, but that didn't stop fans and stands from pushing the equally absurd conspiracy theory after he was released that Gucci Mane had indeed died in jail, and that the Gucci that was released from prison was a government-sponsored clone. Now the next conspiracy theory is the industry. Now this is quite a broad term for a conspiracy theory and it refers to a few different things. Firstly, there's the idea of the industry, the kind of shady, Illuminati style group of people that kind of run the music and hip hop industry. They kind of control things, they control artists, they control record labels, the money, the clout, the social media. They base the industry basically just controls everything. But if you want to get more specific and drill deeper into this theory. This also kind of relates to the earlier theory that we mentioned of gangster rap prisons. This of course being the conspiracy theory that the record industry or the rap music record recording industry actually joined forces with the American prison industries in an effort to push gangster rap, music that glamorizes being a criminal, in order to increase the amounts of people that were being sent to prison in America, thus earning profit for the industry. Now this whole topic was covered in an NPR documentary which I'll be honest haven't had time to listen to but uh, it seems, seems like it's probably worth listening to. But also just in general you can refer to the industry as the kind of shady music industry higher ups that simply block artists from having success that they deserve. And we've seen people like DMX call out the industry for not treating him right, not pushing him the way he feels he deserves to be pushed, and essentially suggesting that the rap industry is a conspiracy against him. Sounds like the ravings of a lunatic if you ask me, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still shady things going on in the industry. Next up it's the Mac Miller blood sacrifice. A sad and slightly annoying 
theory that of course the passing of beloved white rapper Mac Miller was somehow done on purpose as part of some sort of blood sacrifice as often seems to be suggested by conspiratorial minded people after the tragic passing of a young rapper. So here's a Facebook post that was actually reposted to Reddit saying that Mac Miller died at the young age of 26. He's about my age. I'm 27. They say it was a drug overdose. I think it's not. Something is up, maybe a blood sacrifice, but I hope not. And then this guy's commented, I'm 27 too. I think they like to kill you at 27 because 27 is nine plus nine plus nine, which here in the UK is a number you dial up for emergency. And of course, upside down, it's 666. So these assholes just like number play. Mass is as close to God they'll ever get. They try to be God. I mean, he was 26, not 27, but whatever. And another Reddit post suggests Mac Miller yet another Illuminati sacrifice, offering evidence for the Illuminati being responsible for Mac Miller's death, saying that in his last music video in the song Self Care, he was in a coffin. He carved into the coffin Memento Mori, which translates to Remember You Must Die. In Tupac's last music video, I Ain't Mad, he gets shot to death. In XXXTentacion's last music video, he's at his own funeral and he's talking to a demon. In Biggie's last album, it's called Life After Death and the cover is him standing next to a curve. Do you believe in coincidences? I believe in fucking idiots and that's what you are for suggesting this. Next up, it's, ha it's the Haitian Jack mass shooting theory. Now, I couldn't find the exact info for the specific theory or a specific mass shooting that Haitian Jack supposedly carried out, but I'll give you some background and I think it will probably make sense. So Haitian Jack was a guy called Jacques, Jacques Agnant, a record producer and promoter who had involvement with both Tupac and Biggie during the period that their fierce rivalry was going on. He'd been a drug dealer and a club promoter and some people have gone on to suggest that he was even an FBI informant. He became friends with Tupac Shakur and Tupac actually even accused this guy, Haitian Jack, of orchestrating the robbery at Quad Studios where Tupac was hit, leaving him in the hospital, but fortunately still alive. Now, he was actually convicted of a shooting at a nightclub in 2004, which led to prison time, and he ended up getting deported to Haiti in 2007. Now, Haitian Jack elaborated on this in a Hip Hop Wired article, being asked, what did you get booked for in 2004? And him saying, I shot this dude out in LA at a club in Melrose. With him saying, that's true. It's what I do, man. That's what I came up in. Going on to say one thing led to another and another, and I found out that what they respect and fear is pain and death. So it's unclear exactly which shooting the iceberg is referring to, the Haitian Jack mass shooting. It could refer to him being responsible for the shooting that ended up hitting Tupac back in 94. It could be referring to the nightclub shootout that he had in 2004 that led him to be deported to Haiti. Or it could refer to any number of other shootings that he was involved in since he said himself that he was in the business of fear and death. And there are other articles that suggest that he has been in shootouts with numerous other people. Next conspiracy is the ODB, the old dirty bastard from the Wu-Tang Clan was gang stalked. Now I've heard the phrase gang stalked used in different ways. It's been suggested by some sites that gang stalking basically refers to just a whole bunch of people ganging up on, stalking, exposing, and harassing a person. This could be the public, this could be the media, or this could be the police and the FBI who we already know were running a lot of surveillance on the Wu-Tang Clan and ODB specifically, but also as this Kanye to the forum post suggests, the gang stalking could also refer to ODB suffering from schizophrenia and him perhaps even falsely believing that he was being gang stalked or harassed by some sort of entities that maybe weren't there. With another commenter suggesting that he watched the You God interview with DJ Vlad detailing ODB's mental illness, saying it was unclear whether ODB was actually being followed by people or just delusionally believed that he was. Eventually those FBI files on the ODB and Wu-Tang Clan were released with the suggestion that there was a 93 page file on ODB himself and suggesting that before he died ODB had been arrested a whopping 15 times from charges ranging from resisting arrest to injuring a child as well as assault and the attempted murder of a police officer. They connected him to the blood gang and at least two murders, as well as describing an occasion that ODB was robbed at gunpoint in his own home. So whatever way you look at it, perhaps justifiably, ODB was indeed being followed very closely by the feds while he was alive, perhaps whilst too being stalked by his own demons. ODB before he passed used to always say they trying to kill me. The Illuminati. That shit was acting. real. That shit was real. It was real. That shit Yo, was real, what they did to my cousin, he was like, my cousin was too real. Now, the final conspiracy theory of the tip, pause, is Eminem's ESPN glitch, which refers to an incident where Eminem appeared as a guest on ESPN, seemingly glitching out, going completely blank faced during the entire introduction, which some conspiracy theorists may suggest is evidence for Eminem being some sort of cyborg or clone under the effects of mind control. I don't know, none of it's true, but here's the clip Marshall Mathers. Some of you may know him as. Eminem, but he's going to join the Saturday Night Crew with our music 
intro starting next Saturday night. But folks, I want to take you to the world premiere of one of his new videos called Berserk. Take a listen. It's headed for the top of the charts. Rick Rubin, who was uh, helping produce that with you, uh, Marshall, when you did that. Yeah, sorry. Live <laughs> TV. <laughs> Live TV freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> no. Um, Yes, I'm sorry, what was the question? So naturally, this has contributed to further theories that Eminem has indeed been cloned, with this being supported by other evidence, including a 2013 incident with Zane Lowe, where Eminem appeared to glitch out once again. Music is always gonna be in my head, so along with myself, that's trapped in it. We're all trapped in your head. It's a byproduct of the records. Oh, you meant your everyone's no, trapped I actually, in no, my head. No, I actually did, you said, no, but I actually did mean everyone's trapped in their own head, and then I just amended it. Oh, that's good. I'm trapped in my head. It would have been way, it would have been way better if you would have, at the front, like, said that everyone's trapped in my head. Right. I probably would have liked that better. I'm you trapped did, in this room. You didn't like, what? <laughs> Actually, 14? no, seriously, no. don't get trapped in, in my your head. head. Yeah, I wouldn't wish that on nobody. You should so. address the camera, because right now there's a lot of people probably <laughs> stay out <laughs> in my head. Okay gang, so now we are moving below the surface. Things are getting deep, things are getting a little darker, and we're about to see some crazy, perhaps even slightly nonsensical conspiracies begin to pop up. So first off, we have a recurring segment in this piece. It's the Memphis Rap Sigils. So this is the idea that there is a bunch of old rap tapes floating around the Memphis rap scene that are actually haunted. This ad laden article from the AV Club explains these Memphis rap tapes aren't actually haunted, but they are awesome. Stop us if you've heard this one before, but the Bass Pro Shop in downtown Memphis is actually an occult monument to Freemasonry or the Egyptian sun god Ra. Or, listen, nobody seems to know what this is really a monument to exactly, but whatever it is, it's evil. So this article kind of goes into detail on a lot of Memphis rap figures, projects that have been kind of satanic over the years, of course mentioning the Three Six Mafia, how when they started out they flirted with horror imagery and went to an explicitly occult place, apparently kicking off a trend of haunted hip-hop that would reverberate through the city of Memphis for the rest of the decade. And it mentions other examples such as Take the Serial Killer's Portrait of a Serial Killer by Infamous and DJ Paul in 1992, going on to say that this hip-hop horrorcore became a trend in Memphis from the early 90s up to the early noughties. Naming a bunch of other artists that apparently had their heyday during this horrorcore period, including Tommy Wright III, DJ Zerk, Al Capone, and Children of the Corn. All of them use Satan and the Devil as metaphors for depression anxiety and the stress of life in the city. Over the time the internet gained an obsession with these spooky horror raps coming out of Memphis and with the help of 4chan around 2017 the conspiracy theory of the Memphis rap sigils took hold with a 4chan user posting the following. Memphis rap sigils refers to the worship of eight tracks that had mysterious properties imbued in them via horrorcore Memphis hip-hop such as my copy of N-Words of Destruction. Now the AV Club article goes on to talk about these mysterious properties saying the details of those mysterious properties are vague and only help the theory grow in several bizarre directions. The wildest theory postulates that these sigils are coded messages signaling the location of the Nephilim, gigantic demigods from the ancient pre-Christian past that the US military is hiding in underground bases in the deep Appalachian Mountains. This all ties in with flat earthism, somehow. The remaining conspiracy theories tied to Memphis rap are all garden variety occult stuff revolving around the cassette tapes themselves as sigils, magical symbols used in ceremonial magic to call upon a particular supernatural entity. Traditionally, sigils take the form of seals, but all kinds of creative projects can be viewed as sigils. A user on 4chan summed up the general idea thusly in October 2017, saying basically, if you believe in the Luciferian idea that it's possible to take a life and manifest that energy into something that becomes real in a sort of ritual, there would be some kind of medium between the spirit world and the world we know to be true. The life energy, death energy, the demon, the magnetic taping in a cassette. Now of course none of this is true and the article goes on to say that the Memphis rap sigils are the online manifestation of the base human tendency to take something unfamiliar and frame it in supernatural terms. Even on 4chan most know Memphis horrorcore is just scary fun like the poster who wrote in May 2018 None of them are actually into it, 
they just like the aesthetic. I'm exactly the same way myself, not saying it's a bad thing, but none of these dudes are actually out there worshipping Satan, it's just a look. And look, if you were a Memphis rapper and you wanted to build a whole bunch of folklore and backstory around your music by just throwing in a bunch of horror or haunted aesthetics into the cover art and into some of the lyrics to get yourself a little bit of long-term underground clout, hell, mission accomplished. Because it seems like these occult references are probably the only thing keeping these old Memphis rap tapes relevant. Next up, we have the Lil Peep subversion conspiracy theory. This is the suggestion that emo rapper Lil Peep, who unfortunately passed away from a drug overdose, was somehow murdered or sacrificed, with one blog post even going as far as to say that the death of Lil Peep wasn't an accidental overdose, but was in fact part of a carefully orchestrated plot by the alt-right. This article goes on to make a bunch of convoluted theories about how Lil Peep kind of got into Marxism, communism, and was positioning himself to be a future revolutionary. And I've got to chuckle a little bit as I say this, like Russell Brand. Now this piece basically goes on to suggest that Lil Peep was so influential amongst his young, impressionable fans, and that his voice was getting so big in music, the conspiracy theory goes that the alt-right had to have Lil Peep murdered before he would turn radical and radicalize the next generation of lefty, communist, socialist, Karl Marx loving, I don't know, it's a load of bollocks, but you get you get the theory. The article even compares the tragic passing of Little Peep to the takedown of far-right provocateur and idiot Milo Yiannopoulos. Thankfully, the article does end by saying it was the author's intent to be read as humour or satire in order to mock the various alt-right outlets that spread conspiracy theories as absurd as this. Agreed it's absurd, but it's interesting enough to take its place on the hip-hop conspiracy theory iceberg. Now circling back to the prison hip-hop industrial complex, we have the next conspiracy theory, which is The Meeting. This is of course referring to that clandestine meeting between executives of the music and hip-hop industry and the heads of the American prison industries with the suggestion that it was at this secret meeting that a deal was struck to make hip-hop music more violent to encourage young people to commit crimes and get sent to jail so that these two groups could profit. Now there's an excellent article breaking this down which is called The Secret Meeting That Changed Rap Music and Destroyed a Generation, where a supposed insider who was at this meeting goes into detail on what went down there. Between the late 80s and early 90s, I was what you may call a decision maker with one of the more established companies in the music industry. In early 1991, I was invited to attend a closed door meeting with a small group of music business insiders to discuss rap music's new direction. Little did I know, we would be asked to participate in one of the most unethical and destructive business practice I've ever seen. The meeting was held at a private residence on the outskirts of LA. I remember there being 25 to 30 people there, mostly familiar faces. Many of us did not care for rap music and failed to see the purpose of being invited to a private gathering to discuss its future. We were asked to sign a confidentiality agreement preventing us from publicly discussing the information presented. Somebody addressed the group explaining that the companies they work for had invested millions into the buildings of privately owned prisons and that our positions of influence in the music industry would actually impact the profitability of these investments. The more inmates, the more money the government would pay these prisons. And because most of these prisons are privately owned, they became publicly traded and we would be able to buy shares. He told us that our employees had become silent investors in this prison business and it was now in their interest to make sure that these prisons were filled. Our job would be to make this happen by marketing music which promotes criminal behavior, rap being the music of choice. Now apparently a gun was pulled at this meeting and many people left once they realized what was being discussed, but of course they had signed a contract saying that they couldn't disclose the details of the meeting to anybody. Anyway, the writer says as the months passed, rap music definitely changed direction. I could tell the difference. Gangster rap was dominating the airwaves, violence and drug use became a central theme in most rap music. So that's the supposed meeting between the prison industry and the rap industry. Obviously that's cap, but interestingly that wouldn't be the only theory suggesting that the music industry had teamed up with another big industry to the detriment of their artists and listeners, but we'll get to that later. Next conspiracy theory is that Proof died for Eminem. Now this is a reference to the rapper in Eminem's group D12 called Proof, who was tragically gunned down after a fight at a bar. I actually did an entire video on that, so if you want the full and true story of what happened to Proof, go and check that out. But for this conspiracy, we can go and look at a blog on Tumblr called Media Exposed, a site which comes with an encouraging banner saying the Illuminati is real and it's everywhere, and the title Eminem's Blood Sacrifice and Fame Afterwards. This says in 2004, Eminem predicted his best friend Proof getting shot outside of a club in his music video Light Toy Soldiers. Proof also knew he was going to be sacrificed. This was no coincidence, it was a planned event. Proof died on the 11th of April 2006. Eminem took time off after Proof's death, the elite let him, about three years, and then in 2009 he re-emerged with his album Relapse. 
So it mentions that the Relapse album has several lyrics where Eminem's talking about selling his soul, talking about praying to Satan, blah, blah, blah. Now look, I'll be honest, this article is a load of garbage and it just goes on to point out basically any time that Eminem has ever referenced the devil or Satan, he's basically just saying that he's like a Satanist, some sort of Satan worshiper, and that he sacrificed proof, ironically, giving very little proof. There's a whole bunch of Eminem throwing up triangles, Eminem doing the devil horns on his head. Not very compelling, not the most entertaining conspiracy theory of all. Next up is the Death Row series serial killings. Now this is the conspiracy theory that Death Row Records and Suge Knight, who were famous in the 90s for their work with the likes of Tupac and Snoop Dogg, this is the suggestion that Suge and Death Row were serial killers or involved with numerous killings. Now this one was kind of tricky, I couldn't find too many specific examples beyond the obvious ones about people Death Row had supposedly had killed. But of course there are the obvious suggestions that Notorious B.I.G. was murdered by a hitman that was hired by Suge Knight, there's also been conspiracies that Tupac was actually killed by Suge Knight himself because Tupac was actually planning to leave Death Row Records. And then of course there's the fact that Suge Knight is literally sat in jail now for running a guy over outside the straight out of Compton film set. The next conspiracy theory is the idea that mumble rap is brainwashing. Now mumble rap obviously refers to that kind of modern day brand of rap. Your futures, your little yotties, your heavily auto-tuned that you can't really understand what people are actually saying. And the conspiracy theory goes that this type of modern day kind of brain dead mumble rap is actually actually brainwashing the youth. Now this stems from a Reddit post titled Mumble Rap is Brainwashing According to George Orwell, which says in 1984, George Orwell eludicated the concept of linguistic minimalism, which simply put, is reducing the amount of words present in the public conscious. Mumble rap is controlled and is being made popular solely for the purpose of further dumbing down society. It's not just bad for hip hop music, but it's a signpost clearly demarcating that we are speedily nearing rock bottom regarding culture, intellect, and mortality. If if you listen to mumble rap, I genuinely feel sorry for you. Please stop now. Go read a book, listen to some music from a previous era, or learn another language, or learn how to paint, or anything else that is even remotely intellectually stimulating. Please make haste in doing so before your mind turns to mush and you end up being a mentally deficient, unintelligible, and perfectly controlled and brainwashed slave of your elitist masters, which incessantly force feed you a never ending stream of utter trash, I assume, without any full stops. I think whoever wrote that post needs to have their brain washed with soap. Next conspiracy, this one is a little bit spicy people, the Donda West murder. Donda West of course being Kanye West's mother who tragically passed away in 2007 from complications following surgery. Now there are details about this story that not a lot of people know and the fact is Donda West didn't die on the operating table like some people think. She had actually been discharged from the hospital following surgery and spent a day at home where she passed away. She was actually under the care of Kanye West's cousin at the time who had apparently left her going out to attend and a baby shower. The feud about who is really responsible for Kanye's mother's death has never been fully resolved and a lack of solid info about what went down as well as tense public back and forths with the surgeon who performed Donda West surgery has led several conspiracy theorists to hold on to the idea that she was somehow murdered or at least her death was caused by some sort of negligence. The physician says he wanted Donda to recover from the surgery at a medical facility but he claims she insisted that her nephew Stephen Scoggins a nurse with a PhD in public health, care for her at her home. What's Donda West's problem? Her nurse wasn't there. Her nurse was gone to a baby shower rather than taking care of his aunt. So Donda West's surgeon has spoken out suggesting that Kanye's cousin bears some responsibility for her death due to the insufficient aftercare that was provided. He's even gone on to call out Kanye publicly in the media saying if he had any balls, he would speak out on the truth over what happened to Donda West. And hell, to make this story even weirder, in 2018, it was originally reported that Kanye was going to put the surgeon who had worked on his mother before she passed away, a photo of his face as his album artwork, which Kanye said was part of his healing process, ultimately leading into him being served a cease and desist by the surgeon. Crazy. The next conspiracy theory on the Berg is that all rap beefs are fake. This is basically the kind of general idea that all rap beefs are completely fabricated and fake and that the rap game is basically like WWE, an entire choreographed soap opera with all of the beefs going on between rival rappers taking place quite literally for clout and money. Here's a Quora post where somebody's asking, is rap similar to professional wrestling in the sense that we all know it's fake? 
Somebody replies commenting, rap videos are fake just like rock videos and country videos. Rap lyrics are often fictional just like other genres. Rap artist images are often constructed just like other genres. There are some rappers who prevent a relatively authentic image and whose lyrics reflect their actual experiences, but the WWE is always fictional. So there you have it. You know, you've got people like Pooh Shiesty that seem to be really about what they rap about, but generally as a whole, as a baseline, I would say a lot of what rappers say is fictional, but whether or not all rap beefs are fictional, we know that ain't true. Tupac lives with the Navajos. Now this fits in, this is kind of an expansion pack on the earlier theory that Tupac is still alive, with one specific theory stating that Tupac is alive and well and currently residing with Navajo Indians apparently. Or Na Native Americans, I don't think you're supposed to say Indians. Navajo Native Americans, I don't know. Sorry. So this theory is actually being purported by a filmmaker called Rick Boss, who made a very low budget film alleging to depict the true story story of how Tupac escaped from the hospital after being shot, catching a helicopter ride, and seeking refuge amongst the Navajo in New Mexico, where he's been living ever since. But local filmmaker Rick Boss has an alternate ending. This movie is about Tupac actually escaping from the University Medical Center here in Vegas and relocating to New Mexico, getting protection from the Navajo tribe. When certain FBI agencies are looking for you, the first thing you're gonna do is block the airport so you can't travel out. So the best way to escape is through helicopter, private helicopter to another state. FBI agents can't go onto tribal land without the tribal council's permission. Boss says that's why Navajo land in New Mexico made for the perfect hideout. And while many may dismiss the premise as fiction, Boss says the information for the script came from people in Tupac's family and circle. Nipsey Hussle was killed by the Illuminati, another classic hip hop conspiracy theory. This has been covered in a Buzzfeed news article titled Nipsey Hussle's death has become the subject of a baseless conspiracy theory. Despite the police statements and without citing any evidence, people online have been linking Nipsey Hussle's death to a documentary he said he was producing about Alfredo Bowman, known as a healer for celebrities going by the name Dr. Sebi, who does not hold any doctoral qualifications. After Nipsey's death, Bowman's name trended on Twitter and a search for his name in Google brings up a video claiming Hustle was killed because of the documentary he was creating about Dr. Sebi. Now, Dr. Sebi was a healer, a herbalist, and a quack who claimed to be able to cure AIDS and cancer using a miracle cure that he'd created called African Bioelectric Cell Food Therapy, claiming he could cure cancer, asthma, heart problems, arthritis, and mental health issues. Now, Dr. Sebi was actually arrested by Honduran authorities in 2016 at an airport after he was caught with $37,000 in cash that he couldn't account for, eventually dying of pneumonia in police custody at age 82. Guess that was the one thing his miracle cure couldn't fix. Next conspiracy theory is the Malachi Z. York reincarnation. Now this one is kind of long, complex, it's kind of grimy, I almost don't even want to get into it in this video. But basically, Malachi Z. York is an alternative name for a man called Dwight York who was a cult leader between the 60s and the noughties. He started the United Nation of Nuwabian Moors, a religion based on pseudo-Islamic themes and Judaism, mixed in with other ideas from black nationalism, cryptozoology, UFO religions, and just plain conspiracy theories. Now in the 90s, he ended up leaving Brooklyn with around 300 followers, building his own cult compound called Tama Ray in Atlanta. However, in the early noughties, it emerged that his new religion claiming to enlighten and empower his followers was really just empowering him to diddle his followers' kids. With Dwight Dwight York eventually being indicted on federal charges of trafficking minors across state lines for the purposes of diddling, with York being subjected to the United States' largest prosecution for child, you know. This guy's a real scumbag, basically, is what I'm trying to say to you. I half don't even understand why this guy and his story is even on the rap conspiracy iceberg, but anyway, I don't really understand what the conspiracy theory about him being reincarnated is. I know that he had a son that was kind of out in these streets doing other stuff, maybe that's the supposed reincarnation, but the relationship between Dr. Malachi Z. York and hip-hop does exist, with people like Prodigy of Mob Deep having spoken extensively about his teachings and suggesting publicly that he indulged in some of these readings. What woke you up to the New World Order, these globalist elites and eugenicists? Um, the main thing that woke me up to it was, uh, was a writer named Dr. York, a spiritual teacher from Brooklyn. He had a, a whole community over in Bushwick, on Bushwick Avenue, called uh, the answer Allah. A whole community of people who he was diddling, baby. Prodigy, 
RIP, you, sh you should have you sharpened up. This guy's an idiot. Anyway, the next conspiracy theory is Erica Badu's passion fruit. And by passion fruit, they mean Poontang because this is the theory that any rapper that got to have a little taste of Erica Badu's juicy fruit went on to have an illustrious and successful career. With one tweet saying, according to rap conspiracies, Jay's in the Illuminati, MOD'd years ago, and now we've been seeing a clone. Pac faked his death. Erica Badu's passion fruit makes rappers find themselves. Rakim wrote Summertime for Will Smith. Suge Knight injected Easy e with the AIDS virus. Yes, apparently Erica Badu's passion fruit Poon Tang makes rappers find themselves and produce their best work. And there's an extended article from Global Grind titled Badu's Voodoo, Erica Badu and the effect she has on rappers, Kendrick included. And this goes on in a fairly tasteful way to explain all of the rappers that have kind of hooked up with or been involved with Erica Badu over the years and explaining how their careers skyrocketed after that period. This includes Kendrick Lamar, Andre 3000, Common, the DOC, and Jay Electronica. Next is the Lil Bow Wow limo tapes. Now this relates to a long held conspiracy theory that Lil Bow Wow was, how can I put this? taken advantage of by his bodyguard in a limo many years ago. Now Snopes actually has a fact check article on what they call the Lil Bow Wow rumor. Now this says this rumor generally concludes with the news that Lil Bow Wow had to have a certain number of stitches to repair the damage done during the uh. The person that did it is either Lil Bow Wow's bodyguard or driver. With other reports coming out after this rumor begun to spread that the likes of Snoop Dogg had actually put out a hit on that limo driver. Now Snopes suggests that this is complete cap as does Lil Bow Wow, who responded to these allegations in a Vlad TV interview, a response which many in the comments thought was a little nervous and maybe a bit suspicious. There's, there's been the crazy rumor that you got raped by I mean, your security guard. That's fucking ridiculous. That's crazy. It, it, you've heard that before. Yeah, that was like the first rumor that like ever had came out. Um, I'll never forget that shit. I was in Paris, France. I was in Paris coming back to the States. And um, I was going through the airport. I believe I was going to Philly and um, people gonna say things, that's just a part of the game. You know what I mean? People have said the most craziest shit about people um, all the time, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I don't, I, actually, I don't even know where that shit even started from. I don't even know where that bogus shit even came from. Next up, the New Albion Nation of Moors. Now this relates to our old pal and kitty diddler, Dwight York, the cult leader who allegedly mixed Islam along with black supremacist ideas, the worship of Egyptians and their pyramids, a belief in UFOs and various conspiracy theories related to the Illuminati and the Bilderberg group, lumping that all together as New Albionism, which apparently wasn't theology, but factology. But if you ask me, it's straight up capology, because this guy's an idiot, he's a diddler, and any Rappers that support, follow, or condone this guy's views, or this this kind of freaky, dodgy way of moving about, can suck a dick too. You tell them I told him that. And that's why this guy is serving 135 years in prison from... Yeah, you get the deal. But while we're here, let's just throw in the fact there was apparently a group called the X-Clan. They were a black power movement rap group back in the 90s. And they featured Jacob York, who is actually the son of Malachi Z. York. Now, the final entry on the below the surface level of the rap conspiracy iceberg is living in a casket. Now, this is actually referring back to the Memphis rap sigils and is another example of one of those creepy haunted rap cassette tapes. Tapes that apparently still haunt the streets, speakers and bars bargain bins of the Memphis rap community. Part four, the middle of the iceberg, and we are getting to the real deep stuff, baby. We're drilling down deep into the rap conspiracy berg. We're getting oil. We're getting all star, uh, whatever, man, it's good. We're getting there. Next conspiracy, Kanye is Ziggy Stardust. Now this is quite a simple one. This is the theory that Kanye West and David Bowie, AKA his alter ego Ziggy Stardust are one and the same person. This theory comes from the fact that the Ziggy Stardust album cover has David Bowie standing underneath a sign that says, K West, you know, like Kanye West. This is a pretty compelling conspiracy theory if you're just going on this one picture here. This is described by this blog, liveforlivemusic.com, as a wild theory suggesting that David Bowie, with this cover art with K West emblazoned upon it, somehow predicted the success of our boy Kanye West. It's also said that several of the album's songs also predict Kanye West's rise to fame, with it being suggested that David Bowie himself is Ziggy Stardust and Kanye West is the mythical star man. Of course, this is just a coincidence. The K West is a well-known West London hotel and Kanye definitely ain't the savior of humanity. Next one is that the outlaws smoked Tupac's ashes. Now this is allegedly true. 
Tupac's crew of rapping homies called the Outlaws allegedly rolled Tupac's post-cremated ashes up in a blunt, as revealed in this iconic Vlad TV interview. The next conspiracy theory, pretty hilarious, that apparently Pitbull Mr. Worldwide predicted the Malaysia Airlines disaster, with all of this stemming from his 2012 track, Get It Started, where he says now it's off to Malaysia, two passports, three cities, two countries, one day. According to this Mirror article, viewers on YouTube are convinced that the two passports is a reference to the stolen Australian and Italian passports used by two Iranians to board MH370, and they also believe that the three cities refers to the capital cities of Malaysia, China, and Vietnam, and the two countries are Malaysia and Vietnam. Furthermore, they assert the lyrics, no Ali, no Frasier, but now off to Malaysia. Apparently a reference to Mr. Ali, the man who bought the tickets for the two Iranians to travel on board MH370. An absurd one, but entertaining nonetheless. HNIC2.com. Now this theory relates to the album by the late rapper Prodigy, HNIC2 or Head N-Word in Charge, part two. Now this theory isn't about the album itself, but it's about the website HNIC2.com that Prodigy set up a around the time of this album's release and promotion, but weirdly the website ended up being used to promote a lot more than Prodigy's music, more specifically his crackpot conspiracy theories. Now we've already heard about his fascination of the teachings of cult leader and kiddie diddler Dwight York, so with that in mind it's no surprise that the Prodigy's HNIC2.com ended up becoming not only a promotional hub for his music, but also many conspiracy theories and unusual writings referencing the likes of Dwight York, and many other subjects that are documented in this Fader article titled Seven nuggets of wisdom from Prodigy's long-lost blogs and letters, including calling people out for co-opting counterculture for profit, America's legacy of violence and racism, and weirdly, stabbing couches. In fact, this Medium article exists titled How Prodigy Changed Hip Hop Forever by Stabbing a Couch, an article which documents some of the lengthy and rambling posts from HNIC2.com. Now, HNIC2.com is no longer online, but you can use the Wayback Machine to recover earlier saved versions of the website, which I've done here to illuminate some of the gems that were available on the site at the time back in December 2007, including such gems as Fluoride Detection Part 2. Next conspiracy theory is the Jerry Heller Hitman. Now this refers to Jerry Heller of Ruthless Records, who was in business with Eazy-E of NWA fame back in the late 80s. This theory goes that Eazy-E's manager Jerry Heller and Eazy-E at one point had planned to hire ex-Israeli Defense Force soldiers, partly as protection and partly to potentially carry out an assassination attempt on Suge Knight. With this Hip Hop DX article titled Easy e allegedly hired ex-Israeli soldier to deal with Suge Knight. With this article documenting an account by Jerry Heller's cousin, who said that Jerry and Easy e had indeed hired an ex-Israeli soldier to take out Suge Knight, saying the following. The first time I ever saw Mike Klein, it was a picture of him holding up two severed heads. He was one of those crazy Israeli army guys, and when I met him, he had a real strong crew of guys who worked for him, and they became our bodyguards. Him and Easy got to be real close because Easy liked that Rambo mentality, and Klein was an expert at everything, whether it was karate, fighting, or anything. Once he threatened Shug, then everything was all over. The first thing I heard was he told Shug if he ever comes back, he would chop him up and put him in dumpsters all over the city. And the second thing I heard was he told Shug if he ever comes to the office uninvited again, he would leave in a box. In fact, there's another dimension to this theory that is available on a Reddit thread discussing a lawsuit that Hella had against the producers of Straight Outta Compton with a commenter saying, there's a crazy conspiracy theory that Jerry Hella killed Easy e It sounds crazy, but the FBI were investigating threats against both Easy and Tupac that made it sound plausible. Easy went from being perfectly healthy to dying of AIDS in three months. This happened around the same time Easy was apparently going to fire Hella because Easy discovered Hella was really ripping them off. A big reason they broke up was due to them thinking Hella was sleazy. This turned into a fight between Suge Knight and Dr. Dre versus Hella and Easy E. There's a bunch of different stories. Either Suge Knight kidnapped Easy and tried to force him to sign Dre out of his contract, or he just went in on his own. Hard to say. Either way, it scared Hella, who hired ex ID bodyguards linked to the Jewish Defense League. Those are the same guys that the FBI was investigating for trying to extort Easy e and Tupac. Easy's friends think Easy was given a dirty needle, Suge Knight made allusions to it, and he didn't deny responsibility but also didn't take credit for it. Personally, that's not his MO. He's not an assassin. The guys that Hella hired though, those guys are trained assassins. And to make things even more crazy, apparently Jerry Heller even said in an on-the-phone Vlad TV interview that he wished he'd have let Easy e take out Suge Knight. We're the most successful startup record company in the history of, of the, the music business. 
and you want to kill this guy? I said, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And you know something? I should have let him kill. The Post Malone curse. Now, this refers to a string of incidents where Post Malone's life was in pretty grave danger back in 2018. But the reason why Post Malone was suffering such bad luck has been the subject of terrifying conspiracy theories. So, in August 2018, Post Malone's plane was forced to make an emergency landing after two of the plane's tires blew out during takeoff. This was a terrifying experience for Post Malone, and he said that when he landed, he was mortified to see people on social media pondering and wishing for his downfall. A month after that, TMZ reported that three robbers broke into a home that they believed belonged to Post Malone. Fortunately, Posty had moved out shortly before this incident, but had he not, he could have very easily been face to face with a trio of gun-toting robbers. And finally, also in September, Post Malone was involved in a serious car crash in Hollywood, with Posty being in the passenger seat when the Rolls Royce he was riding in hit another vehicle and a fence ending up in the nearby bushes with the car being so damaged it had to be towed from the scene. All of this bad luck surrounding Posty does make you wonder just what the hell he had done to deserve such tragic fortune. Well it turned out that only a few months before these incident Post Malone had had a run-in with what some have described as the most haunted object in the world. Going into a room which held the quote-unquote Dibbuk box with that being the Yiddish word for malicious spirit this box had formerly belonged to a Holocaust survivor who had escaped the Nazis and occupied Poland and purchased this haunted box which contained the following creepy items. Two 1920s pennies, a lock of blonde hair bound with a cord, a lock of black and brown hair bound with a cord, a small statue engraved with the Hebrew word Shalom, a small golden wine goblet, one dried rosebud, and a single candle holder with octopus shaped legs. Now this haunted box has changed hands many times over the years with owners reporting some of the following creepy things going down in its presence. A series of horrific recurring nightmares, a stroke, a stench of cat urine, a stench of jasmine flowers, hair falling out, light bulbs turning off, hives, coughing up blood, and head-to-toe welts. Now, this haunted box ended up in a museum, and a few months before the terrifying bad luck was stowed upon him, Post Malone had visited that box in person and even touched a guy who was touching it. Next up is reverse industry plants. Now, I've already explained what industry plants are to you guys already. But the idea that the record industry can take a nobody and make them famous, plant them in the industry, turning them into the biggest artists that they want them to be, without that artist necessarily having any kind of discernible talent or skills or just reason that they would be big other than the industry wants them to be big. Well, a reverse industry plant is a kind of creepy idea that's sort of the opposite of this. As has been explained in an interesting Kanye to the forum post explaining, isn't it a little odd that all the rappers like these three who rap about the government conspiracy theories are whack and or corn stalks? Like, is it possible the government finds rappers who rap about them and then pressure the music industry to push them on YouTube or whatever so they become popular like a normal plant? except they specifically pick the wackest possible rappers, so it seems like speaking out against the government is corny and Hobson-ish. And since it's seen as corny, the actual good rappers avoid the subject matter altogether. So what this is saying is that the industry is kind of picking on people that are speaking out against the government, the New World Order, the, Illu the Illuminati, all that conscious bullshit, and the industry is saying, okay, well, we're going to do the opposite of what we do to the plants, and we're going to sabotage the careers of these woke people so that those ideas don't get any push, and the actual good rappers who are doing well also choose not to talk about that subject matter. Now the other theory on what a reverse industry plant is also comes from the Kanye to the forum. This one describes a reverse industry plant as signing older famous acts just to control their catalogues and who, when and where they get to influence. Some labels are doing this to get revenge on artists that they didn't originally sign and profit from. Petty shit is real everywhere, basically forgetting to water the plant and neglecting it. So what this theory is saying is that the reverse industry plant is that the industry gets revenge on rappers that turn them down or stay independent later on in their career when they're kind of washed up but sitting on a catalog of music that's still valuable, signing deals with those artists and getting the catalogs that they were refused earlier in their careers so that they can then control those older artists later in their careers despite having made no contributions to their success at the start. Interesting theory. I'd like to see an example. Labels as trafficking fronts. This is the suggestion that there are rap record labels that are fronts for the trafficking of drugs and hell, maybe in some cases, people. Here's an article from Hip Hop Wired titled, Bout to Blow, Seven Hip Hop Labels Accused of Being Fronts for Illegal Drug Operations. And if you continue, there are numerous examples of record labels over the last few decades that have ended up being accused of genuinely being fronts of drug dealing operations. Fears Entertainment, after a four year sting operation into Bay Area 
Korea rapper Mac Dre's label, the Fed said that it was a front for a nationwide drug ring specializing in the club drug ecstasy. Sucker Free Records in December 2011, former Houston record label owner Big Hump was arrested and exposed for being a key player in a large scale drug network. Sar Entertainment, CEO James Jimmy Henchman Roseman, formerly managed clients like Game and Sean Kingston was arrested by the feds in New York City with him heading a $10 million drug ring. Behind Das Scenes Entertainment, Ricky DP, Branscombe and Charles Ransom were indicted by the feds for moving large amounts of cocaine from LA to Baltimore. Murder Inc, the same thing though they did get off. My personal view, this is obviously cap. There's always gonna be examples where the drug game and the rap game have overlapped over the years. And hell, a lot of rappers do come from these streets and it's not surprising that maybe they will have a little bit of a murky past in the drug dealing underworld, but that doesn't necessarily mean that hip hop labels en masse are all part of some kind of cocaine trafficking ring that I know of. Lo-fi beats mind control. Now this next conspiracy was one that I couldn't really find any information on specifically, but I think I know what it's referring to, so I'm just gonna break it down for you. Now, I think this conspiracy, basically the idea that those lo-fi beats to chill and study to that are constantly booming on YouTube are somehow controlling the minds of the people that are listening to it. Hell, if you want to get all Illuminati and conspiratorial, you could probably say that the Illuminati are using thought control, mind control, MK ultras in the lo-fi beats to study do to make people crazy, to make people serve the new world order. If you ask me, lo-fi beats do have mind controlling properties, mainly that they allow you to focus on getting some work done. Next one, Nation of Islam controls rap. Now, if you are a old head, if you are educated on the kind of hip hop that was popping in maybe the late 80s, the early 90s, etc., you are probably very well aware of hip hop's overlap with the Nation of Islam. Numerous rappers are followers of the Nation of Islam and over the years, many have made it part of their music. Even here, as we can see on this article on Wikipedia, Islam and hip hop in the United States, numerous hip hop artists have identified as followers of Islam. We got Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, Buster Rhymes, Ice Cube, Most Def, Q-Tip, less and less in the 2000s, but we've also got Lil Durk apparently converted to Islam once released from jail. Pop Smoke had his funeral in a mosque and converted to Islam in 2017. We've got Akon, French Montana. There's a lot of rappers that identify with the Nation of Islam or just Islam in general. Whether or not the Nation of Islam controls rap, hell, I couldn't find specific conspiracies for some kind of overarching Nation of Islam control of rap, but hell, I'm sure some of these names that we just looked at a minute ago would love to see their religion, their beliefs, controlling the rap like some sort of New World Order conspiracy ting. Probably not true, but good stuff, good for them. The next theory, Lil Wayne was now, if you've seen my video on how Lil Wayne lost his virginity at age 11, you'll already understand what this story is really about. The conspiracy theory itself will suggest that Lil Wayne was somehow taken advantage of at age 11, and depends on how you look at it, you could say that. What really happened was that uh, it seems that Lil Wayne was kind of pressured slash provided with an older woman who, you know, got a little freaky with him when he was only 11, apparently at the behests and in the company of Birdman, Cash Money Records CEO. CEO. Wayne talks about this in uh, in a behind the scenes documentary where he says to a younger member of Young Money, Lil Twist, that he's gonna do him like Birdman did Wayne back in the day. And you know, even though he's young and underage, bring some women around to, you know, do, do some stuff. Problem is a lot of people have taken this theory, have taken this nug of information and combined it with other theories that we're gonna get into later in this video, that Lil Wayne's surrogate father, Birdman, and other people involved with cash money, how do I put this? Uh, have a real taste for Young Money, if you get what I'm saying. Now, obviously this isn't true, but Lil Wayne did lose his virginity at age 11 and hell, depending on how you look at it, you could say that that was kind of abusive. CIA drill vibrations. Now, this is another one that I kind of couldn't find too much information about. I did find this one Guardian article called How the CIA Tortured Its Detainees, and it mentions something about a guy that was kind of tortured by they, they would hold an electric drill next to his head. I'm assuming that the vibrations of that drill near somebody's head is like a fear sort of torture. I found another article on Vox called How the CIA Used Music to Break Detainees with the suggestion that music was being used to torture people that were being detained. And how well, for me, if I can combine these two theories together, CIA drill vibrations, I would come up with my own made up conspiracy theory on the spot that the CIA actually invented a pioneering torture method subjecting detainees of black sites all over the world to endless loops of maximum volume, Chief Keith, Lil Durk and King Von songs nonstop 
CIA Chicago drill torture, you heard it first here. I don't know, I just made that one up, but it, it seems like it could make sense, right? Drill, drill vibrations, I don't know. Next conspiracy theory, now this one is super hilarious. Nicki Minaj does not exist. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the conspiracy theory that Nicki Minaj is actually just Jay-Z sped up. You heard, you heard me right. It's an article in the Industry Observer saying that Nicki Minaj is a figment of all of our imaginations. She has been literally crafted by the record industries and all of her songs are just Jay-Z sped up. And if you needed any proof, we've got the smoking gun for you right here. I don't need to see more proof of that. That one's facts. Never seen Nicki and Jay-Z in the same place. Answer me that. Answer me that. Huh? Not actually next to each other. All right, it's one picture. One, whatever. One picture. Doesn't, doesn't matter. All right, two, two pictures. Another picture of them. Doesn't matter. Does, uh, false. Falsehood. Okay, four, third picture of them together. Do, uh, okay, I'm not sure this one's true. Not sure it's true. All right, people, the last conspiracy for this section is the Lord Infamous heart attack gun. Now, Lord Infamous, one of the founding members of 3-6 Mafia, tragically passed away at age 40 as a result of a heart attack in his sleep. A pretty standard passing, one that doesn't really elicit a lot of conspiratorial thinking. However, this particular heart attack has been looped in with another mainstream conspiracy theory that the CIA secretly created an undetectable heart attack gun developed by the US military, which apparently can, without any detection, cause a heart attack to anybody that it is fired at. With one article explaining that the CIA latched onto poisons, ones that were undetectable and appeared to mimic a heart attack, Attack. They found it in a specifically designed poison engineered for the CIA. Only a skilled pathologist who knew what to look for would ever discover the victim's heart attack wasn't from natural causes. And to deliver the poison, the injection was frozen and packed into a dart. Darts from the new secret assassination gun would penetrate clothing, but only leave a small red dot on the skin's surface. Once in the body, the dart disintegrated and the frozen poison inside would begin to melt, entering the blood scream and causing a cardiac episode. Now, whether or not a heart attack gun or even poisonous darts can or have ever been developed by the CIA is one question that's perhaps hard to answer, but whether or not Lord Infamous's heart attack was caused by a CIA heart gun is a little easier to answer, and I would suggest that straight cap. All right, gang, so we are now into the lower part of the iceberg. We're getting deeper, we're getting icier, we're getting frostier, colder, it's getting crazy, people, and the next conspiracy on this list is outrageous. So strap in, you're not going to believe this one. Big Lurch Cannibalism. If you didn't know this story, Big Lurch was a rapper from Texas who is currently serving a life sentence for murdering his 21-year-old roommate and eating parts of her body in April 2002. This story is wild. So he was sharing an apartment with a guy that I think may have been his manager and that guy's girlfriend. And one day, Big Lurch got high on PCP and just went into a frenzy, murdering this woman and trying to eat her in the most brutal way. Wikipedia says her chest had been torn open, a three inch blade was found broken off in her scapula. Teeth marks were found on her face and on her lungs, which had been torn from her chest. The friend testified that Lurch was found naked, covered in blood, standing on the street and staring at the sky. A medical examination performed shortly after his capture found human flesh in his stomach that was not his own with the victim's boyfriend saying that he and Big Lurch used PCP the day before the murder took place. Now, he was sentenced to life in prison for this, and some of the shocking details even made it into a TV documentary. Police arrested the raving rapper and placed him in LA County psych ward. In an exclusive interview, Singleton talked to us from jail. Do you know that uh, you were actually chewing on her flesh, allegedly, when the cops came? No, I didn't, I didn't know mention about that. The next thing I remember is waking up in a room by myself, and it was horrible. I mean, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Do you remember getting angry at the victim or at her boyfriend? I mean, all I can remember, you know, the world was going to end, and, and I had to find the devil to kill the devil before the world ended. Tupac's Island. Now, we've already spoken about the conspiracy theory that Tupac is indeed still alive, living out the rest of his days in Cuba, but another kind of side stalk from this conspiracy exists that suggests that Tupac is chilling on an island somewhere, perhaps his own island. Hell, who knows? He made a lot of money from those records. They might have his own private island. Apparently, the source of this conspiracy is from Suge Knight himself, who told TMZ that Tupac ain't dead. He is chilling somewhere on an island. Why you think nobody been arrested if they said they didn't want to kill Tupac? Because they're 
snitching to the police so they ain't not gonna just get arrested. Not just snitching, be smart, son. <laughs> because Tupac not ain't dead. Ain't as smart as you should. Tupac not dead. If he was dead, they'd be arresting those dudes for murder. You know he's somewhere smoking a Cuban cigar. You know what you're doing somewhere. right now. You know what I mean? Ali Vegas gay rituals. Now this one's ridiculous. So rapper Ali Vegas, most well known for well nothing, he appeared in an explosive interview where he supposedly exposed the gay rituals that famous rappers have had to do to get their fame. They send a the stylist at him first. Yeah. Yep. And if the stylist is like, if the stylist report back and be like, oh, he ready. Then they invite you to the party. Like they try to put this tight ass shirt on you. That's what they do. And if you wear the shirt, they like, oh, he ready. He he with it. That's you telling them like, yeah, I'm ready. And then next thing you know, you get invited to the party with the greeting is the man squeezing your dick. Next theory is that Ice Cube is QAnon. So Ice Cube has been related to the QAnon movement for a little while, which in case you didn't know, is a far right political conspiracy theory that according to Wikipedia, alleges that a cabal of satanic cannibalistic pet run a global child sex trafficking ring and conspired against former President Donald Trump during his term in office. So Ice Cube has shared QAnon info such as this banner raised by one of QAnon supporters, I suppose, saying media is complicit in treason. Ice Cube then had to respond to backlash on this, people saying, take this down, QAnon is dangerous. To which Cube replied, stop it, I don't know who the fuck Q is, it's just a true statement. Well, at a certain point, people started to point the finger at Ice Cube saying, God damn it, maybe he's Q, maybe he's Ice Cube, QAnon, QAnon, baby. Now, there wasn't really much proof or much supporting evidence that Ice Cube is indeed the Q shady figure that is supposedly sort of the figurehead for spreading information through the QAnon movement, but there's plenty of proof that Ice Cube has been sharing, promoting, and indulging in QAnon conspiracy theories, including this spin article titled Ice Cube is Sharing Anti-Semitic Memes and QAnon Tweets. And this includes conspiracy theories about black cubes of Saturn, noses being cut off, sphinxes and shit. Pretty sure that, is that so, Beck? It's very clear that Ice Cube is indeed a bit of a sucker, but Q, not so sure. Detox Time Capsule. Now this is the theory that Dr. Dre's long awaited and never released album Detox, which was much teased over a long period of time but never released, was in fact buried underground or saved somewhere as part of a time capsule to be opened by future generations. There's not too much evidence to go on with this theory, other than the fact that Detox never came out, but there's a few little clues like this 2012 article from Soul in Stereo naming the 10 things that should be kept in a 2012 time capsule. What's on the list? Detox, baby. Well, actually not detox, but more specifically, they say that in the time capsule needs to be a blank CD so hip hop fans can download Dr. Dre's Detox when it's finally released in 2062. A Hip Hop DX article also came out later saying that Dr. Dre's mythical album Detox is said to have bangers and heat that unfortunately the world will never hear. Is it possible that Dr. Dre's Detox album that everybody wanted to hear was actually finished and then buried as part of a time capsule for future generations to open? Or was it just whack? Was it just the Compton album that we ended up getting anyway? Probably. Moorish rappers. Now this conspiracy theory relates to the Moorish Science Temple of America, a religious organization founded by Timothy Drew based on the unscientific premise that African Americans are descendants of the Moabites and are Moorish, sometimes spelled Moorish by nationality and Islamic by faith. Now look, I'm not going to claim to know too much about the Moors, but the theory is that there are several rappers that are members of this movement, particularly Nas, who some have pointed out that Nas has dropped several lyrics that seem to suggest that he is pro-Moor or a Moor himself, including the line from Your My N-Words, saying the problem is we started thinking like the colonists till noble Drew Ali started dropping that consciousness. The J Electronica Rothschild Connection. Now we touched on this briefly earlier with the Rothschild record label. This is the idea that J Electronica basically finessed his way into the, the secretive Rothschild family, a wealthy family with centuries deep ties to the global financial and banking systems. Now J Electronica's involvement with the Rothschild seems to extend in a pretty limited fashion to female heir of the Rothschild fortune, Kate Rothschild. She ended up having an extramarital affair with J Electronica 
Oliver after she started working with him, leading to many conspiracy theories, perhaps stoked by the fact that Jay Electronica is one of these more conscious rappers that talks about conspiracy theories in his music anyway. Jay seemed to spend a couple years piping down Kate Rothschild, and at least in the eyes of many hip-hop fans, sticking up two fingers to the Illuminati bloodsuckers. However, the reality is far less exciting, because rather than infiltrating the Illuminati bloodlines, it seems what really happened was Jay Electronica was just a homewrecker, breaking up the marriage of a pretty dull, middle-class, rich white woman with a famous last name. Shit, Jay, I thought you joined the Illuminati. How comes you still can't sell any records? Birdman murders. Now, this is the idea that Cash Money Records head honcho Birdman has been involved or has ordered the murder of several people that he's been affiliated with over the years. Now, for the record, just so I don't get any shooters sent at my head, I just want to say unequivocally there is no proof and there are no convictions of murder against Birdman, though he does have a couple of charming teardrop tattoos on his face that may suggest otherwise. Anywho, there's been several people who unfortunately lost their lives close to the cash money click, and conspiracy-minded fans have pointed the finger at Birdman. This includes Magnolia Shorty, a female New Orleans-based rapper who was shot 26 times in a suspicious double homicide, Birdman's cash money artist BTY Youngen, who was shot and killed in Lil Wayne's Holly Grove neighborhood in New Orleans, Yellow Boy, who was shot dead in New Orleans way back in 1997. He actually belonged to a rap group called the UNLV, who were the first group to sign to Cash Money, with it being said by some that Cash Money Records owner Birdman had Yella killed after Yella humiliated him by pistol whipping him and shooting his car over unpaid royalties, with it even being suggested that Birdman's song What Happened to That Boy was a reference to this murder. To Dr. Dre's, now this is less of a theory and just straight up kind of a weird fact of hip hop, is that there are indeed, there are two Dr. Dre's, there are actually two Dr. Dre's, they're not a clone, there's not a Dr. Dre clone running around making beats, making detox all over town, there are actually two Dr. Dre's. The original Dr. Dre, Andre Young, who we know from NWA and The Chronic, and Dr. Dre, or Dra, or Dra, with a little accent above the E, I don't know how you say it, the American radio personality and former MTV video jockey. There he is the other Dr. Dre. Not as glamorous looking as the other, as the main Dr. Dre, but eh, you know. Daylight Simulation Theory. Now, this one, again, was a little bit of a hard one to find, but battle rapper and internet clown, kind of hilarious, recurring character on DJ Vlad with a crazy face tattoo, Daylight or Dalet. He basically has pushed this theory, he said it a few times in lives, that he believes that we're all living in a simulation. Now, I don't know if this is a hip-hop conspiracy or just a worldwide global conspiracy that seems to be being pushed in this case by a hip-hop rapper, but Daylit believes that we're all living in a video game style conspiracy. You be the judge for yourself. This is a simulation. None of this is real. Lil Uzi Vert Hell Concerts. Now, this relates to an incident in July 2018 where Lil Uzi Vert basically told fans at a festival performance that they were going to hell with him. Lil Uzi Vert's been no secret to the satanic imagery in his music and in his artwork, but this was quite a striking incident where he told the fans to their goddamn faces that they were going straight to hell with him, leading to what I would describe as kind of slightly confused and embarrassing scenes. Hold on, let me explain something to them real quick. Before everybody starts screaming and saying, oh, like I told y'all earlier, you motherfuckers have entered the rapture. And if ain't nobody flying up to heaven right now, obviously all y'all motherfuckers going to hell. Right with me. So, let's get it. Oh, you already here. I'm so sorry. You can't get out. You're stuck. It's over. OVO Moloch worship now. I love this one. This is the theory that Dreg's OVO owl that's on pretty much all of his merch, his label, October's very own, this is his branding, is actually covert worshipping of the child sacrificing god Moloch. This deranged Facebook post says, if you watch the rappers like Drake, they show so much Moloch symbolism, it's all over the media showing their allegiance to Satan in exchange for money and fame. The background of Saturn worship goes back to 600 BC. The ancient Romans referenced in several prom- Ah, oh, fuck, this is bullshit. The Carthagnian god Baal, or Moloch, was the same god and devoured children. Similar to Cronus, who ate children. Moloch is the owl deity that the Illuminati sacrificed children to at the Bohemian Grove Resort. The owl symbolism is all over the place. Maps of Washington DC on the dollar bill. It's a common theme in the Illuminati and Masonic symbolism. Yes, people, apparently Drake's OVO owl that is on nearly everything he owns is actually a low-key reference to child-sacrificing god Moloch. Only problem is, Moloch isn't an owl! 
Oh no! If you look up Moloch on Wikipedia, apparently the Canaanite god of child sacrifice, since the medieval period, Moloch has been portrayed as a bullheaded idol with outstretched hands over a fire. So he's not actually an owl, though he does though he does gobble up kids. Kinda like Drake. No, I promise myself no more. Anyway. In this conspiracy's defense, even though Moloch is actually more of a cow bull type thing and Drake's OVO thing is an owl, let's not forget the owl has kind of spiky ears so they almost look like horns. And then over on this truth test blog, it says Drake worships an ancient golden owl cow god from space. This article then goes on to say that this is a bohemian symbol and members of the bohemian grove would dress in capes and chant around a giant owl effigy offering a child as a sacrifice. It then goes on to talk about Moloch, but it, it never points out that Moloch is sort of like a cow bull thing, and that owl is, is an owl, which isn't Moloch. Like, Moloch is the thing that's the child. Anyway, it's a load of bollocks, but shout out Drake. KRS1 started me too. Now this one is a doozy, guys. So, <laughs> it's been said, it's been, it's been said, okay. So the founder of me too, Tarana Burke, right? Due to her uncanny resemblance to to woke rapper KRS-One, many people have suggested that perhaps they are the same person. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it. That's Tarana Burke, that's KRS-One. Tarana Burke, KRS-One. I'm not saying anything, okay? I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying there's some conspiracy-minded people out there, bad actors, who say these are the same person. And you know what? Shame, shame on them. Shame on them. Kanye faked the car crash. We all remember Kanye West's iconic car crash through the wire. He had a late night car crash after a studio session, ended up wrecking his car, breaking his jaw. He had his mouth wired shut and ended up recording his hit song through the wire where he quite literally wrapped a hit song with his mouth still wired shut. However, there is a conspiracy theory floating around the internet that it's all straight cap baby and that Kanye West actually faked his entire car accident for clout. The story goes that Kanye West was supposedly actually beaten up and then used the car crash as a cover-up for having his face beaten so badly. This Yahoo article shows a tweet talking about the feud that led to that fight saying, Kanye was working with an artist called Payroll from a hood in Chicago. Payroll purchased a stellar Kanye produced track and crafted the track Never Change. Somehow the beat ended up in the hands of Jay-Z who loved the beat so much he wanted to keep it for himself. So Payroll's Never Change became Jay-Z's Never Change. Apparently Payroll was broken off nicely for his services, but as hood legends go, he wasn't happy with the overall settlement. What ensued after would be known as the Bottle Incident in which Payroll showed up to a birthday party where Kanye and the go-getters were chilling, brandishing a champagne bottle with it being inferred that Kanye had his jaw broken before GLC stepped in and knocked out payroll. To me, this is the stuff of conspiracy legend, but hell, who knows, maybe that champagne bottle over the head is what made Kanye so freaking weird. Cannabis abducted by men in black. Now this one is straight up crackers. Now washed up former Eminem rival and battle rapper Cannabis embarrassed himself duly in 2012 when he arrived unprepared and wearing a sling to a king of the dot battle against disaster. Towards the end of this battle, it became clear that Cannabis couldn't remember his pre-scripted bars, ultimately throwing in the towel and reaching for the notepad, telling the audience that even though Cannabis had technically lost the battle by reaching for his written rhymes, that since everybody there came to listen to raps, he should be allowed to finish his battle reading his lines from the notebook. So after this embarrassing flop, pulling out his notebook and reading his rhymes instead of engaging in the real battle, Cannabis would attempt to save face the following day, releasing an extended apology on Tumblr where he claimed that before the battle, he had been abducted by men in black style aliens. And of course it was that that caused him to lose at the rap battle. Telling Tumblr, recently I had an incident that caused an atomic like reaction on the world wide web. I stepped into a lyrical battlefield to face a challenger who was worthy of my best, yet could not receive the best of what the Ripper could present due to complicated circumstances. Unfortunately Rippers, I could not be at my best. And my explanation for this is something only someone with a proper attached device in their mechanism can comprehend. 
A few days before the King of the Dot Vendetta event, I was abducted by human blood-sucking leeches who did not make their identity known, but I assume were agents of the Dark World. While in my vehicle, ready to pay for a toll, a helicopter attached with a satellite device that promotes fear flew directly over me. Upon being aware of what was happening, I decided to escape on foot and flee from this radioactive device that can cause mental and emotional harm to any man, even a man who possesses the brainwaves of a complicated degree such as myself. As I abandoned my vehicle, I got to a fence, and as I climbed underneath, the helicopter got visual contact on its target, and there was nothing I could do. Completely lost in a parallel universe, I was removed from consciousness, and as I woke up, I had secret agents of some kind asking me why I decided to battle in this event that was being broadcasted worldwide. I explained to them it was strictly hip-hop related, but they did not believe me. They used Chinese water torture methods at first to try and break my spirit to no avail. They attached wires to my skull and moved on to Alternative 2. Then they inquired about my knowledge of secret societies and my experiences in the military. Something I've never told anybody is that one morning while in the military, I woke up and was interrogated 86 hours straight about all the infinite rhymes that I released. He goes on, it's a load of nonsense. He lost the battle and this is just straight up embarrassing. DMX Demons. This is one that I've struggled with. I couldn't really find too much explaining anything more than DMX having, you know, the traditional demons that we knew he had. He was addicted to drugs, he was a troubled character, he couldn't really get himself together. He was definitely suffering from a some sort of demon affliction. Things weren't quite right for DMX and it was a sad story. DMX was also no stranger to talking about the Illuminati and to be honest I couldn't really find much more on this one other than the following clip. It's not so much who, it, it's what, you know, what happens and, and the things that the devil does. It's not so much a person even though he, he acts through people you know, you can't call one person the devil. Joe Arpaio? You know, you can't call any one person the devil. You can't do that because no one person has enough power to be the devil. This is God's country because I met the devil here. Because if I hadn't met the devil here, I wouldn't realize I was strong enough to overcome the obstacles that the devil would place in my path. Black Bar Mitzvahs. Now, Rick Ross, in October 2012, released his mixtape, The Black Bar Mitzvah. Now, this got him in trouble with the Gangster Disciples for entirely different reasons. But this was one of the earliest and most clear uses of the phrase Black Bar Mitzvah in hip-hop. Now, this cover itself led to some people online digging up conspiracy theories about Black Bar Mitzvahs and what this might mean, with some people pondering on Reddit why it was that Rick Ross and also Drake had earlier on used such heavy Jewish symbolism in their music. An article actually was written by the new inquiry titled Deeper Than Rap, Black Bar Mitzvahs and the New Rick Ross. This suggests that the likes of Rick Ross and maybe to a lesser extent Drake are kind of offensively co-opting Jewish symbolism and stereotypes because it fits in with their worldview that they love money combined with the stereotype that Jewish people are rich and good with money. It points out that Jay-Z has also previously used the phrase Black Bar Mitzvah and that Drake actually got rebar mitzvahed in the music video shoot for his song Hell Yeah Fucking Right. It's unclear exactly what the black bar mitzvah is, whether this is just simply rich rappers giving an accidentally offensive nod to the Jewish faith because they love money, or whether perhaps it's something a little bit deeper to suggest that rich black entertainers go through a black bar mitzvah when they get rich, casting aside any anti-Semitic opinions they might have had in the past in an attempt to fit in with what they see as the rich upper class people that they're now rubbing shoulders with now that they're successful. Chapter 6, we're now getting to the bottom, baby. This is the iceberg's booty. This is the bottom feeding section. We're getting to some of the most insane, weird, trumped up conspiracy theories. The long reach. This is Michael Jordan in Space Jam with his long arm reaching to try and make some of these conspiracy theories seem real. But you know what? They're highly entertaining. So we're going to keep going and we're going to get right to the depths of the conspiracy iceberg, baby. And next up, it's 9-11 party music. This one's crazy. Party music is the fourth album released by the little known American hip hop crew, The Coup. Now here's the crazy thing, in June 2001, The Coup had a cover art for this project made, which was this, yeah, this, this was the cover art they had made in June 2001, three months before the 9-11 attacks. So the cover depicted these two guys blowing up the World Trade Center months before Osama bin Laden and his crew of ball bags made it happen for real. But then again, let's not forget in reference to that old Biggie lyric that the World Trade Center had been attacked with explosives in the past, way back in 1993. So it's not unthinkable that somebody might be out here trying to create some media that relates to this kind of thing. 
But here's the wildest thing. This album was scheduled to be released in September of 2001. Luckily, slash really unluckily, depending on how you look at it, the tragic events of September 11th played out before the album was released, fortunately giving the coup time to push their release back to November and come up with a new cover art. But apparently, members of the group had even tried for a period to keep the cover art as it was even following the attacks, releasing some very misguided comments where they seemed to suggest that the United States almost deserved what happened to them. Arsehole. Reptilian handlers, there's not loads on this one floating around either, but what I'm assuming is that this is just the idea that, that a lot of the rich and famous and successful people of the world are secretly reptiles, just cloaking themselves in human form to fool us all. And there's actually this one video floating around that seems to accuse Justin Bieber of being some sort of reptilian humanoid, which I assume can just be applied to every rapper in the game. In March 2017, a mysterious headline popped up on the internet that read, hundreds of fans claim they saw Justin Bieber turn into a giant reptile. The original website where the article appeared was the dubious Australian news site, Perth Now. In the story, several anonymous sources gave colorful descriptions of the supposed incident. Apparently, the Biebs was found shape-shifting at a Perth airport, and hundreds of fans witnessed the pop star undergo this drastic transformation into a slimy lizard person. Oh, but no one, no one filmed it. Yeah, tight. Tight, good one. Next up, it's drakeblowjob.jpg. Now, I do know a lot about this one, which I definitely can't show you, because it's very much not safe for work, but it is pretty easy to find. Basically, there's a 12 second clip floating around that depicts a guy that looks a lot like Drizzy Drake. How can I put this? Gobbling, gobbling it up, eating it up. He's, uh, he's gobble, he's, you, you know what he's doing. He's getting, he's getting some action. Now this particular drakeblowjob.jpg, the idea of it really was pushed when Drake and XXXTentacion were beefing. X actually shared a still image from the video in question and atting Drake in the process. However, this was quite easily debunked. It actually turns out that the Drake in the blowjob picture was actually adult male performer Bruce Jackson. So we can therefore assume that Drake indeed has never sucked Wiener on camera. The XXX Tentacion prophecy. This is the idea that XXX Tentacion prophesized his own murder just days before it took place in this eerie Instagram live video. Worst thing comes to worst, I fucking die a tragic death or some shit and I'm not able to see out my dreams, I at least want to know that the kids perceived my message and were able to make something of themselves and able to take my message and use it and turn it into something positive and to, to at least have a good life. I at least, if I'm going to, if I'm going to die or ever be a sacrifice, I want to make sure that my life made at least 5 million kids happy or they found some sort of answers or resolve in my life. Regardless of the negative around my name, regardless of, of the bad things people say to me, I don't give a fuck. In addition to this, several people have also pointed out that there are numerous lyrics by XXXTentacion that seem to reference his own death or seem to prophesize what would later happen to him, including this Reddit post titled How X Predicts His Death in Train Food, which reaches pretty hard to try and link lyrics from this song to what happened to him on that fateful day he was assassinated. Frequency programming. Now this is actually the idea that certain sound frequencies can program people to behave in a certain way with the suggestion that hip hop music is being used, certain frequencies are being used in hip hop songs to program what people think, feel, and what they do. Music is frequency programming. Music is frequency. What frequency are you being fed? If I play with those frequencies, right, I can target certain parts of the mind, target the frequency to go to certain parts of the mind, and I can literally, if I want you to astral project, or if I want you to go to sleep, or if I want you to go into a meditative state, I can make my music do that. So as you just heard, XXXTentacion has spoken on frequency programming before, which has of course led his ravenous fans to regurgitate this theory in numerous ways. So this Reddit post basically suggests that there are certain frequencies associated with certain emotions, turning grief into joy, undoing situations and facilitating change, solving problems, and it suggests that certain XXXTentacion songs run at certain frequencies in order to help people and make them feel good. Not sure I believe that, but okay. Juice World Devil Pact. 
So this is speculation that Juice World sold his soul to the devil in order to achieve fame. There are a lot of lyrics in Juice World songs that refer to the devil, Satan, selling his soul, etc. And it's understandable that fans have latched onto these lyrics and created this theory. Here's one Reddit post that said, after Juice World died, we saw he told the truth and didn't lie or cap that much in his music. He talks about selling his soul a lot. On Rental, he says, I had a good soul until I sold it. Empty, he says, my world revolves around a black hole, the same black hole that's in the place of my soul. In Blast Off, he says, you're the devil's daughter. Say hello to your father. He owes me $20. In the entire hook of conversations was him talking about selling his soul and now being in hell. In Dark Thoughts, he says, now Lottie, you're my soul. He said that because he didn't have a soul anymore, but she does. On the light, fuck if I owe fines, the devil says I owe him for life. I can keep going, but what do you think? I think it's Cap, let the man rest, but I can understand why people think this. The Four Corners Incarnation. This is one I really struggled with too, guys. So a lot of people on these iceberg chart comments are actually looking for an answer to this one, including this post that says, does anyone know about the Four Corners incantation? I live near Memphis. I'm obsessed with the Memphis underground, but I can't find anything about it. I assume it has something to do with Satan or the occult. Now, I, look, I tried to look into this. I couldn't find anything, but what I did find was a guide on how to call the corners, which is essentially an entire paganistic ritual that people use before they begin spell work or spiritual work. It's basically a ritual, a process that you can go through that you do before you speak to the dead or you do some kind of mystical occult shit. In my opinion, it's just a really complicated list of arbitrary things that you can do that probably put you in a little bit of an exhausted state, so you could probably imagine something like this happens to you. But anywho, this could involve gathering certain objects. It can also involve writing down quarter calls, which often rhyme, deciding if you want to make them rhyme. So this could be lyrics of songs that are quarter calls. This could be saying that actual rap lyrics are part of quarter calls and that they rhyme and that some of the evil raps are actually summoning the devil or some kind of satanic spirits. It also says that as part of these rituals, some people burn sage. Hell, this could be rappers burning blunts. They light candles that could also be rappers lighting blunts. And they create these kind of pentagrams with candles. And we've seen a bunch of other different rappers create the pentagram. This is the ASAP mob using satanic imagery, all sorts of things. That's the best I could do on that one. I don't know. If you guys know, maybe let me know in the comments. Sasha Fierce Possession. So this is actually the idea that Beyonce's alter ego, Sasha Fierce, actually possesses her or that Beyonce is sometimes possessed by some kind of evil alter spirit that controls her and takes control of her body. And this has been supposedly proven by several videos of Beyonce acting kind of erratic on stage. So this Cosmo Mo article says crackpot radio host says Beyonce is possessed by a demon with him saying it's very clear that she was using a number of satanic symbols I mean pentagrams as part of her routine and a ring with a baphomet a goat headed idol on it too that's how Satan manifests himself as a goat with very long horns at one point even her facial features change at half time she lays down in this circle and she went from being a sort of girl next door to something dark and malevolent in fact the images were so disturbing that her handlers actually contacted people and threatened to sue them if they posted these images of her on the websites. There's actually a YouTube compilation which purports to show a montage of Beyonce possessed by the Sasha Fierce demons. Like here, she kind of like walks up to Jay-Z and just puts her head in him. And he, you can see that he's even kind of a bit like, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And then she basically kneels down in front of the crowd, all fours, and just gets to whipping her hair back and forth like some kind of possessed goddamn Willow Smith looking motherfucker. Look at that. Possessed. Illuminati confirmed. Next up, Ciara has a huge wiener. Apparently, Ciara has both male and female reproductive organs, according to this conspiracy theory. This is actually something that's been floating around with Lady Gaga um, for quite some time as well. Unfounded. Load of garbage. Has anyone else heard this? A guy on my team told me and I thought he was lying at first, but a lot of people said they heard her say it. And how the hell did it spread around the world? When One Two Step came out, I was in like grade two. I remember watching the video on MTV and my sister told me Ciara was born a man and don't watch that video. Now I know Future likes a dirty sprite, but I don't think he likes them that dirty. ASAP Horus. Now, I believe this is just simply a reference to the ASAP Mob, ASAP Rocky's crew of guys and their brand ASAP Mob, ASAP Worldwide, having numerous Illuminati, all seeing eye triangular references in their clothing. Numerous items from ASAP Rocky's clothing collection including this black scale collab, have references to the Illuminati or the occult, including this Eye of Aurus apparently printed on the shirt. However, for the record, I'd just like to point out that there is a Kanye to the forum post that proposes a different theory of what ASAP Aurus is, 
sharing this hilarious tweet by disgruntled former ASAP friend Space Ghost Perp, saying, I'm tired of holding my tongue. Back in 2011, I was invited to this party in New York by ASAP Rocky. I was pulling up with my girl and shit, and I was on the phone like, yo, bro, where you at? I don't see you. He was like, yo, look down, I'm right here. Next thing I know, I see he's in a pool rubbing a man's ass. Perp, that's the funniest thing you've ever said. Dr. Creep predicted COVID-19. Now this one's crazy. So in 2020, after the coronavirus pandemic took hold of the world, TikTok discovered an old song that predated the pandemic by years had actually referenced it all the way back in 2013. In a track called Pandemic, the unknown rapper Dr. Creep had apparently said, 2020 combined with coronavirus body stacking. However, he explained later on, saying that even way back then there were multiple coronaviruses in existence, suggesting simply that it was a complete coincidence that the song he wrote in 2012 perfectly predicted that the bodies would indeed be stacking in 2020. Beyonce's surrogate mother. Now this theory suggests that Beyonce didn't physically give birth to her and Jay-Z's child Blue Ivy, and that a surrogate mother was used in order for Beyonce to maintain her good figure. And apparently these rumors intensified when Beyonce appeared on an Australian TV show showing a baby bump which some said folded in on itself. But to make things even more crazy, in order to support this conspiracy theory, a woman named Tina Seals actually came out suggesting that she was the surrogate mother to Blue Ivy and unsuccessfully attempting to sue Beyonce. Though for the record, we can be pretty sure that this wasn't true, as she also attempted to sue Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, alleging to be a surrogate mother of one of their children. Do anything for clout. The Christ Bearer Self Castration. Now, if you're a fan of my main channel, you may have seen I did an entire video about the Wu-Tang rapper who chopped his wiener off. But in case you haven't seen that, let me give you the quick update. Essentially, Christ Bearer was an affiliate of the Wu-Tang Clan, being part of the group the West Coast Killer Bees, and being a friend of RZA collaborating with him on a a couple of tracks. Anyway, as years went by, Christ Bearer became more and more estranged from the original Wu-Tang crew, struggling with drug problems, relationship issues, and child support one night whilst under the influence of PCP or bath salts, some crazy mind-altering drug, he ended up chopping off his own unit and jumping off a balcony, but miraculously surviving the event, coming out of the situation with his life intact and some of his penis. We are officially under the iceberg, people. Things are about to get dark, dingy, and deep. So strap in, get ready to feel the conspiracy vibes of under the iceberg. We're about to feel the pressure of the berg. Whatever, let's just get on with it. The next conspiracy is the Aaliyah Amelia Earhart reincarnation theory. In case you didn't know, Amelia Earhart was an American aviation pioneer. Being the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, unfortunately, Amelia met an untimely demise, disappearing on a flight in July 1937 and being officially declared dead on January 1939. However, some conspiracy-minded people out there seem to believe that the hip-hop adjacent singer and former girlfriend of Dame Dash and R. Kelly, Aaliyah, was somehow Amelia Earhart reincarnated or re-embodied, reanimated. Absurd, I know, but it is a theory that people believe. In fact, there are several conspiracy theories around Aaliyah's life and death, which were covered in this article on meaww.com titled, Was Aaliyah Killed by the Illuminati to Make Way for Beyonce? Three Wildest Conspiracy Theories Around the Singer's Death. With this article going on to mention the Amelia Earhart theory saying, one theory points out that Aaliyah died on August the 25th, 2001, and Amelia Earhart successfully completed her transcontinental flight on the same date in 1932. The link here is that they were both on planes, and that's about as deep as it goes. So yeah, that's pretty much just, they were on a plane on the same day, obviously on diff decades apart, and apparently that's enough for people to think Aaliyah is Amelia Earhart reincarnated. Next up is the theory that Dipset rapper Cam Ron cured AIDS. Shame he wasn't on hand when Easy e got juked up with that needle by Suge Knight, isn't it? This is kind of a loose conspiracy theory that stems from some lyrics that Cam Ron dropped on a couple of his songs. So firstly, on the song Confessions, Cam says, I said man fuck a AIDS test because I'ma go raw anyway, I'm one that liked to chase death. So this gives us the initial suggestion that perhaps Cameron has some kind of secret reason that he doesn't fear the AIDS virus. Perhaps he does indeed have a cure in his back pocket. Combine this with the lyrics from Cameron's song IBS, which from the outset looks like a very simple ode to the irritable bowel syndrome, a stomach condition that Cameron seems to suffer from. However, several of the lyrics that he drops in this song related to his IBS condition could also be applied to the AIDS virus. Talking about he used to be a stocky dude, 
suggesting that he's lost weight, saying every day his stomach hurts, throwing up in public, people saying he's got the symptoms of a dope addict but they haven't found any drugs in his system, saying the doctors couldn't find anything, losing weight and muscle, being too sick to do shows. Now the song ends with Cameron revealing that he was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. But this could just be a front for his secret diagnosis of the AIDS virus, which he then went along and cured, proven by the fact that he's still with us today. But these lyrics aren't the only thing suggesting that Cameron indeed had the AIDS virus. Our old pal 50 Cent actually publicly called out Cameron and made fun of him for having AIDS symptoms. So in an early version of the Young Buck featuring 50 Cent track, Hold On, 50 Cent ends up talking over the outro, dissing Cameron, saying you ain't got IBS, you got AIDS. He's talking about you got IBS, nigga, you got AIDS. But Cameron is of course still with us today, so we can assume that the conspiracy theory that he secretly has a pink cure for AIDS is indeed true, or the entire thing was complete cap. The next conspiracy is the Missy Elliott demon. Now the idea that there is a demon inside Missy Elliott or hidden inside her music basically comes from the fact that on her hit track Work It, there is a kind of clip in the chorus where she sort of says some stuff, it sounds like it's in reverse, it sounds like it's some kind of hidden demonic message. <laughs> However, in reality, this this is actually just quite a smart reference to the lyrics that she says previously to this reverse message because earlier in the song she says I put my name down flip it and reverse it and then you know we, we hear a little reverse audio clip it sounds it's cool it's like reverse it and then we hear her in reverse but that hasn't stopped people still thinking that there is some kind of demon or hidden satanic message in the song and apparently it took the idiots on the internet a goddamn 15 years to realize that she had simply just been saying I put my name down flip it and reverse it backwards after she said that or as other people have suggested the actual audio on the track is Missy saying watch the way Missy liked to take it backwards but just played you know backwards. Next conspiracy is the Blue Ivy Bloodline. Now this one was a little bit light on the ground but I think I've got it. So the Blue Ivy Bloodline theory could relate to one of two things. The first and more safe for work theory is that Jay-Z and Beyonce's child Blue Ivy is somehow connected to the British royal family officially placing Beyonce and Jay-Z in the British royal family bloodline with this Daily Mail article suggesting that William and Kate's royal child will be a long distant cousin with Jay-Z and Beyonce's Blue Ivy with about 26 degrees of separation. I mean, hell, I'm probably related to Blue Ivy with 26 degrees of separation. Shout out my cousin Blue Ivy. But the other slightly more insidious explanation for the Blue Ivy bloodline theory is that Beyonce and Jay-Z's daughter actually hails from the bloodline of Satan slash the Illuminati with the suggestion of several ridiculous acronyms for Blue Ivy's name that suggest that she is indeed somehow the spawn of Satan with some saying that BLUE of blue stands for born living under evil and Ivy standing for Illuminati's very youngest. Which even if it's not true as an acronym for the spawn of Satan would be a pretty fire name for a three person rap group. It's been suggested that Blue Ivy backwards spells Elubielvi, apparently Latin for Lucifer, which isn't true. But hell, it's a nice try, isn't it, people? Next up, it's the Bull Society or Boule Society. Now this one's quite interesting and there's actually quite a lot of truth to this one. So the Boule Society actually refers to Sigma Pi Phi, which is apparently the first non-collegiate African-American fraternity with it apparently being the oldest black Greek lettered fraternal organization. This is essentially like a secret fraternity, secret society, genuine real Illuminati or skull and bones type organization for successful black professionals at high levels of achievement in their career. And to me, this is actually just super interesting and quite cool. I mean, for many years, conspiracy minded people have poured over the likes of Skull and Bones, the secret student society from Yale University that many presidents of the United States have alleged to have been involved with. And I think it's pretty cool to find out that hell, the Sigma Pi Phi exists. There's a black version. We got black secret society. I say we, not we, but you know, the black community. Hell, that's it. Black Illuminati, baby, Billuminati. But I know what you're thinking. How does this relate to the hip hop genre? It's just the black Illuminati. Well, I am excited to tell you people there are apparently several rappers that are members of the secret Boulet Society. Billuminati confirmed double time. This Mad News UK blog post seems to suggest that there are several rappers that are involved in the society including Diddy, Boule Society confirmed. Oh, of course, yep, yeah, Puffy is satanic, so he would have his friend, yep, yeah, of course, of course. Who else is in the society, come on. Okay, apparently Jimmy Iovine is in the Black Illuminati. I mean, you know, I, I guess their membership criteria is not as stringent as it sounds at the start. Dr. Dre, also another Boule Society Black Illuminati stooge. 
Eminem, another black Illuminati member, apparently. And apparently these three guys own 50 Cent. Ooh. Jay-Z, of course a member. Of course. Jay-Z is probably the only rapper that's a member of the actual Illuminati and the Boulay Society. Fuck it, T.I. T.I.'s a member too, throw T.I. in there. Well, apparently DMX was in the Boulay Society too, but his addiction to crack cocaine led him to being forced out. Obviously, they've got a no cocaine policy in the secret society, and that does make sense. Mace was a member, apparently. Minister Mace. Member of the, of the Black Illuminati. Apparently the game also, he's not a blood, he's not a gangster, but he's one of the bull's biggest hoes. Apparently uh, the guy that made this video, he doesn't make this stuff up, he does his research, it's pure fact. But there's numerous episodes, more rappers are members of the bull's society. God damn, who else we got? Who else we got in the society? Ice T, Ice T, Black Illuminati, Boulay. Nelly! Nelly, of course, you know that plaster is covering up his secret Illuminati microchip. We all knew it. Jermaine Dupree, member. Who else? Who else we got? Luda. Luda's a member. Luda's a member of the secret society. I swear, this is this guy. Is this guy listing members of a secret society or just putting together a Tim Westwood compilation album? But people, it's not just rappers. Apparently, entire organizations, according to this Future Producers forum post, the BET, the Black Entertainment Network as a whole, is part of the Black Ball, aka the Black Illuminati. Next. Conspiracy theory is Drain Gang Magic. If you didn't know, the Drain Gang are a crew of rappers coming out of Sweden, including Blade, Tie Boy Digital, and producers White Armor and Young Sherman. They're very closely linked to Young Lean, and these guys have kind of pioneered a sort of sad boy, techno y kind of rap. I don't know, I'm probably going to butcher this explanation, but they're kind of, they're sad boys. They do these vibey, spacey kind of tracks. It's all very different. They're Swedish, it's European, they've got these cool accents, bit of auto tune here and there. It's interesting. But according to this Kanye to the forum post, Blade and Drain Gang are evil, safe satanic and spooky. <laughs> So this says, Blade is definitely into some sort of occultism and has referenced some sort of psychedelics and magical practices. He's taken a much darker turn with the rise of evil money Blade. I theorize he's some sort of psychic vampire who drains his fans. I honestly don't know. He's always posting sigils and now keeps referencing 333. People either think he's a shapeshifter or reptilian given his constant, seemingly uncanny way of changing his face every public appearance. Or he's a prophet trying to warn us of something. Well, look, it's not that compelling, the idea that Drain Gang and Blade are somehow draining their fans of their positive energy. But there's proof. If we head on over to this Reddit post titled How to Get Out of the Drain Curse, we finally hear the truth. As it says, Drain Gang has killed all my hobbies. I used to actually enjoy life and have things I was passionate about, but now all I want to do is stare at the ceiling and drain the fuck out. I don't know what's happening. I try to listen to other music, but nothing sounds as good. It's like Blade has put some kind of hex on me, and I don't know how to break it. If anyone has any tips on how to get out of this, please help. Top comment, lose your virginity. I agree. Prodigy Egg Death. Now, this isn't so much of a conspiracy as an unfortunate fact, which is just actually crazy. It's the fact that Prodigy, our conspiracy-minded, prolific writer on all things Illuminati, and Dwight York met an untimely demise when he was being treated in the hospital for a long-term blood disease that he had, but his actual physical death, and this isn't made up or a fake theory, this is actually what happened, he choked on a boiled egg. That's what killed Prodigy. Now, a lot of people, especially considering how much he talked about the Illuminati, exposing the truth about all sorts of things, especially on his blog, hnic2.com, many people have said that it was actually the Illuminati that sent this egg to take out Prodigy because he was obviously exposing, you know, the many truths of the Illuminati, etc. And let's not forget the fact that eggs are kind of triangular, or they're at least pointy. It was in the hospital in Las Vegas that Prodigy choked on the egg. The Clark County Medical Examiner has reportedly ruled his course of death, his cause of death, as accidental choking. He choked on an egg. What? Prodigy, one of the greats. Crazy. Why wasn't there someone to help him not... To, to give him the Heimlich or some shit. But just to add fuel to the fire, for those people that just thought, hell, maybe the egg choking incident was indeed just some kind of minor coincidence, well, let's not forget the mere fact that, according to this digitalmusicnews.com article, around the time just before his death, Prodigy was actually working on a musical about the Illuminati. But what was this mysterious Illuminati musical that Prodigy was working on before his untimely demise at the hands of an egg? Well, that is the next entry in our iceberg, the Illuminati Ball. Now, this one sounds like a massive conspiracy, especially considering the fact that Prodigy unfortunately died choking on an egg in the lead up to this Illuminati musical being released. However, it is quite simply an Illuminati-focused story and animated musical cartoon that Prodigy was simply providing the music to, most likely because he had an interest in the Illuminati and, you know, 
Illuminati related things were a big part of his life. He worked on these kind of projects. He spoke about it all the time. It just so happened he died choking on an egg around the time that this was going on. But that said, it's still quite interesting and it is worth having a look at least at the trailer for the Illuminati ball to see what Prodigy was indeed working on towards the end of his illustrious career. Yeah, welcome to the show. Please settle in. Make yourself at home. Please settle in. Get around, gentlemen and ladies. You don't want to miss this. Shit about to get real. You about to learn some real shit. Lori Joe. TDE Sacrifice. This is the tragic story of how TDE artist Laurie Joe passed away at the young age of 25, apparently the result of suicide with Joe jumping to her demise from a radio tower. Following her tragic passing, it didn't take long for conspiracy theories to begin to swirl online, with many suggesting that her tragic suicide was actually some sort of sacrifice done to aid the careers of fellow TDE top dog entertainment artists like Kendrick Lamar and Ab Sol. There is a Reddit post here titled Really Shitty Conspiracy Theory on Why Alori Joe Died. So this article says, since Alori's death, Kendrick has reached stardom. He signed with Dr. Dre's Aftermath Entertainment back in 2011, released Good Kid Mad City, MTV crowned Kendrick as the number one hottest artist in the game. He won five awards at the BET Hip Hop Awards, covered GQ, and was called the next king of rap. Then going on to quote Professor Griff of Public Enemy, saying that in order for an entertainer to become very rich and famous, somebody is blood sacrificed. And furthermore, ridiculous YouTube videos continue to circulate online with titles like TDE Exposed Must See a Laurie Joe Sacrifice. The Rihanna Rain Man Entity. So this is the suggestion that there is some kind of demonic rain man type entity or figure as a demon who haunts but also helps successful music artists. This random blog page with the title The Illuminati is Real and It's Everywhere says Rain Man is a demon who is described by some celebrities, for example Jay-Z, as a being who whispers beautiful numbers to him while he writes lyrics. Well, Jay-Z doesn't write lyrics, so that's debunked. He doesn't write shit down. Anyway, he mentioned this spirit is crucial to him in the process of writing lyrics. This article goes on to suggest that the Rain Man is mentioned in other songs and this mysterious figure can make people rich and famous and give them any man or woman they desire. Apparently, Rain Man is a possible demon involved in the music industry, which artists possibly sell their souls to in exchange for money, status, and more. Ooh, a mysterious figure called the Rain Man who somehow has some sort of demonic control over the music industry? I can't think of any really successful songs that involve rain. Oh, wait! Oh my god. Rihanna and Jay-Z talking about rain being under umbrella, Ella Ella A's. It is Illuminati confirmed people, and there are many hidden messages supposedly in this video that purport to reference the mysterious demonic Rain Man, including this silver bodied figure that Rihanna represents for a portion of the video, even appearing crouched over in some sort of Illuminati triangle in the video. And I'm not the only person who picked up on this because apparently this still image exposes the head of the devil's face. This is the Rain Man, this is the moment. Apparently Rihanna sold her soul to the devil and to Rain Man to make money, and it has quite literally rained cash throughout her career ever since she made a pledge to this terrifying Rain Man demon. And it's not just Rihanna who is apparently pushing the satanic messages in this song either. Because in a blog post on conspiraciesuk.wordpress.com, it suggests Jay-Z's rap at the beginning of Umbrella is him portraying somebody who has already possessed and under the umbrella of the evil entity who we could say is the devil. Hell, in this lyric, Jay-Z even calls himself Rain Man saying, Jay, Rain Man is back with Lil Miss Sunshine. Rihanna, where you at? Dipset did 9-11. Now this is one of the most ridiculous and probably offensive entries in the entire rap conspiracy iceberg. The idea that Dipset did 9-11 actually comes from the fact that following the tragic September the 11th attacks on the world Trade Center in New York, New York rappers from Dipset like Cameron and Joel Santana begun to drop lyrics that seemingly supported the attacks on America and even went as far as to show admiration for the men that carried it out. This article from OK Player is titled Revisiting Dipset's Complicated and Provocative Relationship with 9-11. This article says the crew played up on patriotic imagery with eagles in their logo and a heavy red and white blue flashing. On their masterful double album Diplomatic Immunity, they had a song called Ground Zero where they declared they made 9-11. 11 music. However, they also called themselves the Dipset Taliban and Harlem's Al-Qaeda, comparing themselves favorably to Al-Qaeda leader and chief dickhead Osama Bin Laden. Apparently at one point, even rapping the lyric, I'm the realest thing popping since Osama Bin Laden, so pay homage. And apparently on the original version of the song, I Love You, Joel Santana rapped the shocking lyrics, I worship the prophet, the great Muhammad Omar Arta for his courage behind the wheel of the plane, reminds me when I was dealing the cane. He is compared 
comparing himself to the guy that flew those planes into the towers, saying that he had that same courage when he was slinging dope on the block. This is the dumbest lyric I've ever heard. And thankfully, this actually was taken out of the song, but eventually did end up getting leaked, so everyone knew that he had said this fucking dumb shit. And look, there's a lot of dumb lyrics Dipset have dropped over the years, referencing 9-11 in the most tasteless of fashions. A lot of them are summed up on this genius forum post, Dipset's many unbelievably cursed 9-11 references, cataloging other dumb lyrics that they had dropped over the years, including, I ain't mad the towers fell, I'm mad the coke price went up and this crack won't sell. Young Muhammad Atta, no plane lessons, cocaine lessons to supply the towers, I had for they crashed and divided the towers. In fact, Joel Santana even went on to make a very flimsy attempt to defend his lyrics, praising the pilot on that plane, telling NME, I feel my diplomats and my team and I'm gonna do whatever it takes for them, for my people, you know, the same way he did for his people. Not that I support him or what he did, but in order for him to do that, you know, it had to take courage and love for what he believed in. A lot of New York people don't have that. Maybe if they did, something like that wouldn't happen. Fuck you, you're an idiot, Joel Santana, you're not. The 37th Chamber, now this is a reference to the Wu-Tang Clan famously having 36 chambers. The name of their first album is Enter the Wu-Tang, brackets 36 chambers, with this being a reference to the 1978 kung fu movie, The 36th Chamber of Shaolin. Now in this original movie, each of the chambers are basically just different sections of a martial arts training temple teaching a different thing. You know, you got the sword chamber teaching broadsword techniques, the leg chamber teaching kicks, seventh chamber has empty hand-to-hand -hand combat, head strength, fifth chamber eyesight, etc. Now, I kind of feel like they just put this on the iceberg as a joke, the 37th chamber as a conspiracy theory, because everybody knows that there are 36 chambers, enter the Wu-Tang, it's 36 chambers. I looked for a while, I couldn't find any conspiracy theory on what specifically the 37th chamber is, so I kind of feel like this is a, just a joke and some cap, but if you do Google the 37th chamber, what you actually do end up finding is the L. Michaels affair, enter the 37th chamber. This is actually just a musical project by retro funk producers the L. Michaels Affair who remixed Wu-Tang Versus. It's a remix album basically, it's, you know, I haven't listened to it, it seems like. And finally we have the theory that all new rappers are deep fakes. Now if you don't know what a deep fake is, it's basically using technology to kind of recreate a video or an image or even an audio recording by a specific person using a computer to generate that artifact as opposed to it really happening. It's a fake, it's a deep fake. You can make a fake song that maybe sounds like it was made by Jay-Z and this actually happened with a deep fake audio recording made to sound like it was done by Jay-Z circulating on YouTube with Jay-Z himself actually striking that deepfake recording and accusing the creator of unlawfully using an AI. Now other people have gone on to do this including funnily enough H3 Productions who actually had a kind of deepfaked Jay-Z intro made for his podcast. You're listening to the HP podcast who we got on the scene could be Papa Shoe Nice Bill Delphine talking front wipe or back wife what you gonna do with me then you know and the whole damn crew. However, the wider theory that all new rappers are deep fakes, there's not really too much evidence for that, but I would probably assume that this theory is essentially just the idea that all this new generation of rappers, people like DaBaby, even mumble rappers that came through in the past few, five, 10 years, Lil Yachty, Roddy Rich, NBA Youngboy, there is a conspiracy theory, I assume, that all of these new artists are just straight up deep fakes. Manufactured and engineered, I assume, by the shady record industry for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe it's part of this prison industrial complex, maybe drill music, Music has all been deep faked to try and send people to prison. Maybe all the real rappers just ran out of good bars and we needed Google's AI technology to come with that heat in 2021. I don't know, it's time to move on. We're nearly all the way gang, now we are getting to the abyss. We are beneath the beneath. We are under the, under the, under the iceberg. We are in the dark evil, scary zone. We don't know what we're gonna find here. It's gonna be some of the most terrifying rap conspiracies of all time. First off is Sentient SoundCloud. This is quite a simple one, not dissimilar to all rappers being deep fakes. This is the theory that SoundCloud itself is sentient. It's a sentient being powered by artificial intelligence using an algorithm to create the optimal artists, songs, and sounds to generate the most clout in the modern day hip hop era. This Reddit poster says this is why modern day rappers 
Jumpers are all so goddamn weird and sound the same. And hell, if I didn't know any better, I would assume that somehow the industry are behind the sentient SoundCloud and this entire wave of mumble rappers that we've seen over the past few decades. Drake killed XXXTentacion. Now, I actually did an entire video about this on the main channel where I basically broke down the theory that Drake had XXXTentacion murdered as a result of their beef, including numerous lyrics, lines, hints in Drake's later music that some idiot slash conspiracy theorists have taken as proof, self-snitching, that Drake indeed did have XXXTentacion drilled for making fun of him, you know, sharing the Drake blowjob pic, shooting his shot at Drake's mum, all that good stuff, to the point where X even posted on his Instagram at one point before his tragic passing, if anyone tries to kill me, it was Drake, atting Drake Champagne Pappy on Instagram and saying, I am snitching right now. Who is Mr. Fantastic? Mr. Fantastic is a rapper that has appeared on numerous MF Doom projects over the years. Nobody knows who Mr. Fantastic is and conspiracy theorists have been trying to work out who the heck this guy is for years now. There's a DJ Booth article titled The Unsolved Mystery of Mr. Fantastic, MF Doom's Unknown Collaborator. And this goes on to say for the past 15 years, there is an MF Doom mystery that's remained unsolved. In 2000 2003, a rapper named Mr. Fantastic featured on Antimatter on the project Take Me To Your Leader, an album Doom released under one of his many aliases, King Ghidorah, and a year later Mr. Fantastic appeared on Rap Snitch Niches on MF Doom's Mm Food. The collective assumption is that Mr. Fantastic, whose name coincidentally fits nicely within MF Doom's career-long comic book theme, is an actual rapper. In the minds of many, his bars were lined with such expertise that there was simply no way that this guy didn't rap for a living. So who is he? The most popular theory by far about Mr. Fantastic's identity is that he is a pitched down version of Rodan a fellow rapper whose relationship with Doom stretches as far back as the late 80s. And fans attribute the plausibility of this theory to similarities between the voices, flows, and relationships with Doom of both Rodan and Mr. Fantastic. This article goes on to theorize and look at a few other different theories floating around Reddit of who Mr. Fantastic actually is, but ultimately concludes, the true identity of Mr. Fantastic will likely remain unknown, with some finding comfort that the discussion itself has become more substantial than the answer. No lead or clue is truer than the other, and no guess can be ruled completely false. Maybe it's better that way. NWA serves the NWO. Now this is a theory that suggests that the rap group, the, the countercultural Compton-based rap group NWA somehow had some role to play in supporting, aiding, or even creating the New World Order. However, upon reading the following Reddit thread titled, Did NWA, Rap Group, Help Inspire the Creation of the NWO? But looking at this a little bit closer, I think they're talking about a different NWO. It says here, both the NWA and and the NWO are both groups that were popular for having attitude and being anti-establishment. And then reading in the comments, it seems like there's a bunch of people talking about the NWO as the New World Order, including the link to a uh, an article here that seems to suggest Tupac had some sort of influence on the NWO. But then as I read further, I'm pretty sure there's people fighting over whether the NWO had anything to do with the Illuminati concept of the NWO. And it made me realize they're talking about did NWA inspire the NWO, the New World Order, the wrestling crew, not the New World Order Illuminati, Freemasonry, secret, I don't know what they are to be honest. This is a professional wrestling stable. They use, they use kind of black and white backgrounds. I don't know if the NWA had anything to do with these guys. But if you were looking for proof that NWA inspired the literal New World Order, there is the fact that in 1991, Easy e actually visited the White House and ended up meeting with George H.W. Bush, or mere inspiration for the New World Order. Perhaps this is indeed Illuminati confirmed. Easy e Eric Wright is his real name, would be among this group of well-off Republicans who paid $1,250 to become members of something called the Republican Inner Circle, who were waiting in line today to hear law and order man George Bush at a private members only reception. Quasimodo Tulpa. Now Quasimodo is a side project for hip hop producer Madlib. Quasimodo is this kind of alter ego persona. It's this little character here. He's released a few projects under the name Quasimodo. I remember bumping the unseen a lot when I was younger after discovering the album, hearing low class conspiracy on a Tony Hawk's game. Anywho, a Tulpa is a kind of imaginary figure. It's like a non-existent being that you have kind of conjured up using your imagination. Here's an explanation from fandom. A tulpa is a thought form being created 
from the collective thoughts of separate individuals. The concept of tulpas is theoretical in nature and originates from Tibetan Buddhist mythology. Tulpas are described as extra bodies created from one person's mind in order to travel to spiritual realms. So I assume the theory of the Quasimoto Tulpa is that Quasimoto, the character, is actually a Tulpa, a non-existent spiritual being that has been conjured up using the mind of Madlib, and perhaps Madlib sees Quasimoto. Data, you know, maybe he actually sees this fucking with weird, this weird little, this little weird little mascot thing, walk, chilling in his crib, walking around. I don't know. That's that's the best I could do on this one, but that's the Quasimoto Tulpa. The cash money. O ring. We've already heard about how Birdman of Cash Money Records had apparently pressured an 11 year old Lil Wayne to pop his cherry at the studio back in the day. But the weirdness between Birdman and young lads goes a lot deeper than that, with many people suggesting that Birdman perhaps has a fetish for the young, and with other conspiracy theorists even going as far as to say that Cash Money Records itself is some sort of Jeffrey Epstein style Ring. There's a lot of forum posts floating around like this one on Lil Wayne HQ saying Birdman finally exposed as a posting up this picture of him posing in a towel with a young boy, which I actually believe was just like a photo where some young fan had like bumped into Birdman at the changing rooms of like a luxury high-end gym. This kid's probably the son of a billionaire. He's probably in a luxury suite and just bumped into Birdman and wanted a picture. But a lot of people took this of Birdman posing with a cute little twink as proof of the cash money ring in full effect. Combine that with the fact that there are a lot of weird connections. For example, you've got this billboard article that says Cash Money's Birdman and Slim connected to sexual assault lawsuit. This was back in 2012, and for the record, the guys at Cash Money denied any wrongdoing in this situation, but it's all a bit creepy. Obviously, there are numerous clips that show Birdman kissing Lil Wayne on the mouth, and when you combine that with the fact that Birdman met Wayne when he was around eight years old and ended up helping him lose his V-plates by 11 is a little bit sus. But the real ground zero for this conspiracy theory is this lipstick alley thread called the Brian aka Birdman Baby Williams tea thread and several unidentified forum posters go on to drop a vast amount of tea on Birdman pushing the unsubstantiated theory that he is indeed running a ring with comments such as baby is a fool with his money he was bouncing checks all around town and wasting on alcohol little boys and strippers baby keeps a lot of single mothers happy by quote borrowing their sons his is one of the reasons juveniles stopped messing with cash money. What's more tragic is mothers lease their kids out for a few dollars here and there to that fool. That's a real tragedy. Sounds like the posters are dropping tea about Baby's alleged deviance with boys. It's been whispered about for years. Baby is a known No one in his circle says anything, mainly out of fear. He's been known to whack a N-word here and there. When we were in college, it was rumored that he was the one who had mystical sister whacked. When Wayne Turk and BG was starting out, he basically became their surrogate father. He used to kiss them all in the mouth, with the exception of juvenile before stage performances and on tours. It's really sick. He gives a lot of single mothers money and takes their sons on, quote, trips. And if you see pictures of him in public, there's always some mystery young'un with him. Look, there's no proof. I don't want to push this theory. I'm a little bit scared of Birdman. So let's just make it clear once and for all, there is no evidence for this and that is complete cap, as far as I know. The Kanye Truman Show. Now, this is a simple theory stemming from the fact that Kanye West has said several times in interviews that he feels like he is Jim Carrey in the movie The Truman Show, a film which famously depicts Jim Carrey living in a world which he thinks is real, but it turns out is an entire production stage managed around him with him being secretly filmed for a reality show. Kanye says this is how he feels, and perhaps this conspiracy theory is the idea that that is indeed true, and Kanye West is genuinely living in a Truman Show style fake world with everybody just watching him for entertainment. Now, obviously that's ridiculous, but to a certain degree, there's a certain amount of cultural truth to that because we are, as a society, as hip hop fans, as music fans, just as people that follow the media, we're all watching Kanye like a goddamn soap opera. We're watching his marriage fall apart. We're watching him release music. We're watching him have these breakdowns going on TMZ, saying he's gonna run for president. He is basically kind of living the real Truman Show, but you know what? It's a creation of his own doing. He wanted to live like this. He's put himself out there like this. He's run for president. It's realistically his own narcissism that's led him to even believe that the entire world could be some sort of Truman Show based existence around him. If I was Kanye, I would just go back to the studio, focus on some music, make some more stupid shoes. Just fucking just stay out TMZ, man, you know? And Christ, shouldn't have got with Kim Kardashian, that was an L. Anyway, Mad City Murder Confession. Now this one is crazy. This is the theory that Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid Mad City album is in fact a genuine murder confession and that Kendrick Lamar has allegedly murdered people, including a man when he was 16 years old. A lot of this stems from an MTV interview where Kendrick Lamar says, the things in his rap are real, this is his real story. These are my experiences. When I say gangbanger made me kill a Blacker than me, 
these are these are this is my life that I'm talking about. I'm not I'm not saying you you might not even be from the streets. Not, not I mean, every black person is in the yeah, game. Yeah, not in the game. Has that I'm, you you. This is, I'm not speaking to the community. I'm not speaking of the community. I am the community. Mm-hmm. My homeboys, those are my real homeboys on my album cover. They still over there. So he's referring to a lyric where he says that gangbanging made him kill somebody blacker than him. And he's saying these lyrics are my real life. This is real. I'm not talking about the community. I'm talking about myself. So this is the suggestion that Good Kid Mad City is a genuine murder confession and Kendrick was out here dropping fools. And this theory is broken down in more detail in a DJ Booth article titled What If Kendrick Lamar Really Did Kill Somebody? Because now that we know that Kendrick Lamar just said that this album, Good Kid Mad City, is genuinely about him and his experiences, not a representation of the community that he's from, then some of the following lyrics begin to seem a little bit alarming. Such as, I've been feeling this way since I was 16. If I told you I killed a man at 16, would you believe me? Or see me to be the innocent Kendrick that you see in the street? Why did I weep when Trayvon Martin was in the street, when gang banging made me kill an N-word blacker than me? As a kid, I killed two adults. I'm too advanced. My innocence has been dead. She. Kendrick Lamar murdering two people when he was a teenager? I mean, he kills the mic. He probably kills that pussy. But killing two motherfuckers? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to believe it. But maybe this is why Kendrick ain't released an album in so long. He's just praying for repentance for those scenes. Picasso Baby Spirit Cooking. Now, this one's pretty creepy. This relates to Jay-Z's music video for Picasso Baby, which featured the famous artist Marina Abramovich. Now, Jay-Z and Abramovich actually ended up in a feud a little while after this video because Jay-Z decided that for the concept for his Picasso Baby music video, he would perform in an art gallery to the audience faces for around six hours hours, a stunt that was actually inspired by earlier work by Marina Abramovich, with her even agreeing to appear in the video with Jay-Z rapping at her at one point. Now apparently, Abramovich's involvement with Jay-Z's video was on the condition that he would set aside some bread to support her institute, something that she went on to say that he didn't do. Jay-Z called her out for capping, saying that he actually did donate, even suggesting that he had receipts to prove that he had indeed made a significant donation. But anywho, that's not what the conspiracy theory is about. The conspiracy theory actually stems from Marina Abramovich's dark past, a specific art project that she created called Spirit Cooking. Now, if you ask me, this is just a big old pile of pretentious bullshit, but then again, I'm not really in the art world but this this art piece and there's a video floating around of Marina Abramovich she's kind of just writing these bullshit spooky slogans on the wall in blood I think it's pig's blood and I mean look at some of this bullshit she's writing with a sharp knife cut deeply into your middle finger of your left hand eat the pain I mean what a fucking psychopath and that's that's meant to be art really you're a hack anyway the idea of spirit cooking is actually considered by some a sort of satanic ritual basically because of her pretentious provocative and frankly quite whack artwork Marina Abramovich has been lumped in with these kind of satanic devil worshippers. She's been linked to Pizzagate. And unfortunately, because of that and the connection with Jay-Z through the Picasso Baby video, it's been suggested that Jay-Z too is partaking in some sort of satanic demonic spirit cooking through his and her involvement in the video. Whatever. The wise owl laughs at the crowd. Now, this is kind of funny. This is actually just a lyric from that disastrous cannabis battle rap where he turned up in a sling. He basically lost, got his notepad out, just started reading his pre-written bars, then writing on his blog the next day that he'd been abducted by the men in black. Well, this is a lyric from that battle that many people have mythologized, suggesting has some sort of deep meaning. Now, as a result of these pseudo deep bars, it seems that the idea of the wise owl laughing at the crowd has been mythologized by the likes of Reddit, with many people pondering what was it that Cannabis really meant with this lyric? With this post on the Rap Battle video archives attempting to decode what Cannabis was truly saying. I'm sure most of you still don't get it, even though Cannabis laid out many clues. So this post is basically just explaining that they believe that Cannabis's entire appearance at that battle was a complete satire, and he's actually a complete genius for throwing this, this fucking... I don't know what it would be. Some sort of modern, contemporary, postmodern art piece where he just turned up and completely threw the battle and somehow that makes him a winner. But on the second point explaining this, it says that Cannabis said counter psychological pressures reduced the pressure. Basically, it didn't matter if he choked at the battle when he was trying to choke anyway. And I'm sure many of Cannabis's bars that he meant to hit actually didn't, but it wouldn't matter. Don't forget that the wise owl laughs at the crowd. This is kind of trying to suggest that his line, the wise owl laughs at the crowd, is actually like a really deep layered metaphor because Cannabis is really the wise owl who knows that he is actually just doing a satire of battle raps and battle rappers. He's throwing the entire competition into the toilet on purpose and he is actually telling the crowd, I'm the wise owl. I'm laughing at the crowd because none of you guys know that you're being finessed and this is all a satire. 
obviously bollocks. Obviously, he is just a mess. Couldn't keep it together. Lost a battle rap. It's embarrassing. Kabbalah Ghostwriters. Now, this is a tricky one. I couldn't find too much info about this, but I did see somebody commenting on the rap conspiracy iceberg on the Kanye to the two forums, saying, I'm really curious to know more about the Kabbalah Ghostwriters. I know Michael Jackson, Madonna, and David Bowie were rumored to have Kabbalistic writers and references in their music and art. Now, this is a reference to Kabbalah, a written text relating to the Jewish faith. And to me, the most logical explanation of what the Kabbalah ghostwriters theory would be is that there are maybe some kind of group of, of maybe kind of Jewish focused ghostwriters who are writing lyrics on behalf of rappers with theories and morals kind of related to the ideology from the Kabbalah and then slipping those into rap music. And of course, who is the most famous user of ghostwriters in the rap game? Our boy Drizzy Drake, who is known to have had a black bar mitzvah and to put Jewish, you know, put Jewish references in his music. Sometimes he says stuff about being, I don't know. This article by the Jewish Telegraphic Agency is titled Rapper Drake Has His Own Brand of Jewishness, pointing out that Drake is proud to be Jewish and that it's very unusual for somebody of Jewish origin to have gotten so high and so far in the rap game, an industry that's traditionally dominated by people of other faiths, not Judaism. So is Drake using a secret team of Israeli ghostwriters to promote ideas from the Kabbalah in his music? Nah, nah. The Dr. Sebi cult. Now this is the supposed faith healer, the herbal food quack who can cure cancer and AIDS by just giving you some little little vegan diet. This is the guy that people said Nipsey Hussle was making a documentary about and he was murdered by the Illuminati for his involvement with Dr. Sebi. Well, the only proof that I could find for a rap conspiracy that there was some sort of Dr. Sebi cult was the simple fact that there are several rappers with associations with Dr. Sebi or who have at least spoken about his stupid teeth teachings. Therefore, it's possible that there may be a conspiracy that there is some sort of Dr. Sebi cult in hip-hop and that rappers are either secretly pushing his agenda through their music, or alternatively, like the Nipsey Hussle theory, are actually being suppressed and assassinated for agreeing with slash promoting him. In fact, Dr. Sebi has even also been mentioned in a Big Sean song, and I assume even more rappers that, you know, I, if I had more time I would Google, but I can't be asked, and I think Dr. Sebi's a quack, so I don't care. The Liar Cohen Afterworld. This is a weird one. I couldn't find too much evidence on this one, but the definition of an afterworld is a future world or a world after death. The definition of Liar Cohen is an old ass white culture vulture who's been making money off the rap game for the past few decades. Okay, I'm joking. He's actually a veteran record executive. He's been killing it in the rap game for over three decades and has worked with artists from Run DMC all the way up to Young Thug. But the idea of there being a Liar Cohen afterworld likely comes from the idea that in a way, Liar Cohen kind of represents the death of hip hop and the post Lyle Cohen period or afterworld after he's had his influence on the industry is the state of hip hop today. In fact, there are many rappers and industry heads who suggest that Lyle Cohen is actually responsible for the downfall of the rap industry. For example, this Uproxx article has the locks blaming Lyle Cohen for the demise of rap who Jadakiss said will pluck out the hottest kids from the rap game who are making the most noise trying to squeeze whatever money he can out of them before moving on to the next big thing. A lot of times that means milking a hot single for a season or two and then leaving the rapper behind once the trends dictate it. Liar Cohen is the reason hip hop turned out the way it has, with him controlling all these younger artists and their 720 deals. You don't need to learn your history anymore, all you need is green dreads and a Rolex and you're good. And of course you've got the likes of Dame Dash from Rockefeller Records fame, blaming Liar Cohen directly for ruining Rockefeller Records and even going on to suggest that he is indeed a big old culture vulture. We made it, people. We are now in the final chapter. This is the Hadal Zone. We are literally in the depths of hell. We're so deep in the ocean. We're so far under the iceberg. We're submerged in darkness. We can't even see the conspiracies now. We've just got to reach out and try and touch them. we just got to, oh, what the fuck was that? Shit is about to get scary. I really appreciate that you've made it this far, people. So let's keep going down the home stretch and reveal the final batch of the most shocking and crazy rap conspiracy theories in history. First off, one of my favorites of this entire list is Birdman Big Oil. Now, this theory stems from Birdman of Cash Money's oil company, Bronald Oil. 
He was seen some years ago with this photograph of a tattoo on his big old baldy head of a oil drilling rig and the word Bronald. This is a reference to Bronald Oil, the name I assume which comes from the combination of Brian Williams and Ronald Williams, who were Birdman and his brother, Slim, who run Cash Money Records, and also Bronald Oil. And funnily enough, there's even still a website for Bronald Oil that is still live where we can look up some of what they get up to. This is BronaldOilAndGas.com. It's not very cash money, is it, playboy? But here what we have, welcome to Bronald Oil and Gas, a trillion dollar energy oasis. The modern world relies on vast energy supply to fuel everything from transportation to communication to security and health delivery systems. Petroleum, otherwise known as crude oil, blah, 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 blah. It sounds like it was written by a goddamn AI computer bot. There's not really a lot to look at on this website. And if you go to the team page, there's basically nothing to go on other than the guy that set this company up, Raymond Jean Philippe whose email address is bwilliams at Bronald Oil and Gas. Pretty sure that's Brian Williams' baby. Brrr. John Doe and another John Doe, whose emails are R. Williams, who I assume is Ronald Williams, Slim, Cash Money Playboy, and then Raymond at Bronald Oil and Gas, who I assume is actually Raymond John Philippe. So this thing's a mess, basically. It's straight, it's straight up mess, it's straight up cap. And thankfully, this DJ Booth article exists, basically debunking the idea that Birdman even runs this oil company, suggesting that this is some kind of front or fake business, which could either be just a complete failed project and a load of cap from Birdman, or if you want to be more insidious and conspiratorial, the idea that maybe this Bronald oil is actually a big front for some kind of more deep, scary, dark, illicit, fake business, or money laundering, or hell, maybe the sex trafficking ring that Birdman is secretly running, blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff could be connected, or it could all be a bunch of cap. If you ask DJ Booth, it is just a load of bullshit. All the details on the website are fake, and there's basically no proof that Bronald oil have ever been involved in the, in the extraction or sale or trading of oil in any way, shape, or form. Oh, and I also want to point out for the record, just in in case you were wondering whether or not Bronald Oil was fake, the, the website is bronaldoilandgas.us, B-O-A-G.us. The website is literally called Bogus. So just in case you were wondering whether or not this company was legit, I mean, the website's quite literally Bogus. So pretty sure it's, it's Bogus. Brain Entrainment Beats. Now, brainwave entrainment is basically the idea that the brain can be trained and controlled using sounds or sound frequencies. It kind of relates to that earlier theory that we discussed with XXXTentacion talking about frequency programming. But I assume Brain Entrainment Beats is a slightly more wider in scope suggestion that the beats in hip hop are being used to train or control people's brains. There's an interesting article from Mashable called This Is Your Brain on Hip Hop that talks about how rap music can affect the human emotions. Some people have suggested that drill music can make people more violent depending on who you talk to. I don't think there's any real proof of that kind of thing, but I can understand where this conspiracy comes from. Wu-Tang Magnetism. Now, several people commenting on the original iceberg have asked what the hell the Wu-Tang Magnetism one is about. People have gone on to suggest that there's nothing on the internet that seems to explain the Wu-Tang Magnetism theory, but I've managed to find a couple of points to at least provide a theory of what this is referring to. One user posted explanation on the website icebergdb.com suggests, under an entry talking about the 37th chamber of the Wu-Tang, that the Wu-Tang magnetism is tied into the idea of the RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan having an ability to quote, astrally project his consciousness into planes of existence where all consciousness is connected together. RZA basically has the ability to control the energy of the masses since he is literally able to connect directly to the infinite source of all knowledge. But if you want to go deeper, Vice has an article titled, I talk to RZA about magnetism, metal, mercury, how to blend them and forge the greatest weapon ever. And it's actually in this article that the RZA makes a couple of passing mentions about magnetism, saying, I got this theory about magnetism and metal and mercury and all that shit. It's just a theory, but at least in the movie, I'm able to use that theory to forge the greatest weapon ever. It's about molding metals together that molecularly shouldn't be able to mold together. And apparently this is something that the RZA thought about when he was a kid, adding some magic in it and putting it into the movie. So essentially this is just like a childhood idea that the RZA had that he ended up putting in one of his projects. But basically he or somebody could have the ability to meld different types of metal together to forge kind of new age weapons that have never been seen before. Obviously that's not a real thing that can happen, but there's another article that kind of talks about the more metaphorical magnetism of the RZA as a personality, with this article in The Age saying, There's a lot of brothers in and out of the Wu family. Some are more true than others. I look at it as a theory of magnetism. If you have a magnet, it attracts things to it, like other magnets, but sometimes metals. Sometimes the metal can become a 
another magnet, and that's the way we look at the Wu-Tang family. Some of us are permanent magnets, and some of us are temporary magnets. The temporary ones you're not going to see often, the permanent ones will still be doing their thing after combining with the group. That's an explanation from a Wu-Tang affiliate called Diggs, and it kind of makes sense. Perhaps there's some sort of mystical magnetism that draws so many members in and out of the Wu-Tang Clan family, or perhaps it is quite literally just that metaphorical magnetism of this is a group that a lot of people love, a lot of people have an association with, and are naturally attracted to. I don't know, whatever. Kid Boo Raylian Movement. Kid Boo is a whack wannabe SoundCloud rapper that had a bit of a run in 2017 when it appeared that he had not only been lying about his age, but also his origin story, suggesting in various interviews that he is in fact a clone. I was cloned by Clonade in Canada. My model number is 0112568 if anyone wants to see the registration and cloning. Okay. So he suggested that he is actually a clone created by CloneAid in Canada. And this is actually a real organization. CloneAid is an American-based human cloning organization registered as a company in the Bahamas and founded in 1997. It has philosophical ties with the UFO religion Raelianism. And this is what they're saying, that Kid Boo is somehow related to the Raelian movement through CloneAid. Now CloneAid have actually suggested publicly that they have cloned a human in the past, but these claims have never been substantiated and have essentially fallen down at any sign of scrutiny. Meanwhile, the Raelian movement, just in case you were interested, it's a UFO religion with a logo that seems to combine the Star of David and the swastika. Good move, guys. This is a new UFO religion which basically is concerned with the existence of extraterrestrial being. Raelianists believe that an extraterrestrial species known as the Elohim created humanity using advanced technology, suggesting that the Elohim have actually created human Elohim hybrids who served as prophets preparing humanity for news about their ultimate origins, even suggesting that these Elohim human hybrids include the likes of the Buddha, Jesus of Nazareth, and Muhammad from the from the Quran. It's like the goddamn religious all-stars with one of the most offensive logos in history. Whatever. Kid Boo's a fraud. We know that. These guys uh, sound like bullshit to me, but so do most religions. Big Pharma mumble rap. Now this one's a doozy. This is basically the idea that Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, was somehow in bed with the mumble rap industry in order to push pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs on the American and worldwide public using rap music as the perfect marketing for dangerous and addictive prescription drugs. Hell, who remembers Percocet? Malib Percocet. Here's a post from Reddit titled The Rap Industry and Big Pharma. This is how you attack a culture and profit from it. It seems like it would be easy to mix the conspiracy of the 90s rap scene, you know, fuck everyone and everything message that was pushed so hard with the profiteering of socially engineering what drugs are more desirable. These borderline mumble rappers like Future and whoever else are the peddlers. They probably look at it like simple drug dealing when in fact what they're doing is using the roots of their culture and the inspiration they provide to people not to help but rise to the top of the hill and look down on their commoners. Basically using their lyrics to get people hooked on drugs. Percocet. Malib Percocet. And there's people in the comments saying I've been publicly bringing up the relationship between the Sackler family and record label owner and Zex ever since I heard Percocet Molly Percocet. Hell, the Big Pharma conspiracy theory that big pharmaceutical companies basically operate for profit to the detriment of society and they don't really want to help people, they just want to get people hooked on expensive and addictive pharmaceuticals for their entire lives, is a conspiracy theory, but there are elements of that theory that uh, kind of do make sense. I mean, the American opioid crisis is out of control and pretty insidious. And hell, when you've got articles like this one on Dazed, talking about Xanax, the drugs that defined the decade and changed rap, well, hell, it does seem like for the past five or 10 years, hip hop has basically been one big advert for Zans, Perks, Oxys, all sorts of prescription drugs that people, definitely young people, shouldn't be taking. And you know what, there's, there's actually, I'd say there's a... There's, there's obviously no proof that Big Pharma is actually in cahoots with the rap game. But I'll tell you what, all of these guys talking about prescription pills constantly ain't good for the world. Four hours. Now this isn't a reference to the crusty British high focus based rap group, but apparently is another reference to the Memphis rap sigils. I couldn't find the specific four hours project that this is referring to. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of find the Memphis rap sigils like the least interesting of some of these theories. So, you know, the four hours is some, is some haunted Memphis rap tape, go, whatever, go find it, leave it in the comments. Next up, all rappers are gay. It's been said by some that the Illuminati is using rappers to make people gay for some reason. You've got the likes of 
young thug dressing up in a dress, you got Birdman and Lil Wayne kissing each other, you got Cameron wearing nothing but pink. Apparently, the Illuminati won't back you financially unless you're repping their gay agenda. Well, speaking of hip hop's gay agenda, here is a Reddit article titled Hip Hop's Gay Agenda. So there's a secret gay agenda in hip hop and Hollywood that rappers, celebrities from old and new get into the industry by doing gay stuff or allegedly being in the closet and rappers nowadays dressing feminine are further pushing said agenda. They're worried about how it's emasculating black men into being less manly slash fruity or whatever. Usually this coincides with the Illuminati shit, lol. Another Reddit post, why are there conspiracies about rappers being secretly gay? People say rappers are secretly gay as part of a ritual to get signed by records run by the Illuminati. Rappers like Lil Wayne, P Diddy and 50 Cents are all secretly gay. Rappers are pushing a gay agenda with their gay fashion. This confuses me because rap is a homophobic genre. I don't know what the hell is rap gay fashion. Now look, obviously there isn't a gay agenda in hip hop, even in spite of what Lil Nas X is getting up to day to day. And in fact, the top comment on that first Reddit post explaining hip hop's secret gay agenda does an excellent job in masterfully debunking the theory, at least from Young Thug's perspective. Quoting from Adam22 in his interview with Young Thug, where Adam said, you wore a dress on the cover of your new album and some people said that was you coming out as gay. What do you say to those people? With Thug responding, yo, I got six kids I'm paying child support for. I wish I was gay. Deep web murder samples. Now this is probably one of the very few things on this list that I found nothing for. Zero, now, nada. Couldn't find anything. But my guess is that the deep web murder samples is either some sort of recording of a genuine murder or some kind of red room from the deep or dark web that perhaps had been recorded and then used as a sample in some kind of deep, dark, haunted hip hop song, or hell, maybe even vice versa. Maybe out there exists some kind of haunted or twisted hip hop song that just samples audio from a real murder that took place. And perhaps the reason I couldn't find this example was because it is only available on the dark or deep web, which I'm too much of a pussy to look into. Based God's Last Wish. Now this relates to people calling the Bay Area rapper and frequent curse putter on a Lil B as the based god. But the idea of the based god's last wish is derivative from the idea of God's last wish. A 1 minute 23 supposedly haunted video that to me just seems to depict the annoying orange sort of half superimposed over like a shot of a cloud going by over a street with just like some creepy noises. It's not that scary, but this is sort of being positioned as a kind of the ring type haunted video. And I assume that the idea of Base God's Last Wish is either some kind of Lil B version of this haunted video that may or may not exist out there, or just whoever was writing this iceberg just thought it'd be funny to kind of mash up this conspiracy theory with the Base God, which I got time for, I respect that. The Beyonce Stem Cell Project. Now this is a conspiracy that Beyonce died in the year 2000 and was replaced by a clone this was covered in a Mirror article which said, A conspiracy theory claims that 20 years ago Beyonce died around year 2000 and was replaced by record label bosses who cloned her using her stem cells. And in support of this theory, there are a couple of videos floating around YouTube claiming to provide video evidence supporting the idea that Beyonce did indeed die in 1999 and was replaced by a clone slash imposter. Look, see? Look, see? She's, she's, yeah, uh, she's sort of... I don't know, she just looks like she's aged. They've replaced her with a clone that's also 20 years older. Or younger. I mean, she does look good, but you know, she's rich and famous. She'd probably afford to look after herself, no? Not buying it, but there you go, stem cells, baby. Oh my Lord, I never thought I would see the moment we have gotten to the final conspiracy theory on the iceberg. We are at the rock bottom. We're literally on the surface of the ocean, digging into the ocean floor, looking for, looking for clues, looking for treasure, looking for Illuminati lost gold that fell out the Titanic. This is the final entry, and this is 50 Cent shot himself. This is the idea that 50 Cent, the beloved rapper in the club is where you can find him. Bottle full of bud even though he doesn't drink alcohol he was shot nine times famously that was his origin story they wanted to kill him they shot him nine times but he miraculously survived however this conspiracy theory suggests that 50 cent actually shot himself nine times for clout i pretty much couldn't find a single scrap of evidence supporting this conspiracy theory and the only writing i could even find about it was once again on icebergdb.com in a lengthy and confusing post which said I told 50 the last time I saw him, don't ever forget where you came from. I wouldn't put it past him to shoot himself because he wants to be a millionaire macho dickhead. And that was it. That was it. I mean, I personally could believe that 50 Cent maybe paid one of his goons, Young Buck, Tony Yeo, Lloyd Blanks, to come and shoot him in the ass like that young rapper from that episode of The Sopranos. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin, Daddy, oh. shot me in my ass. 
We made it, people. We did it. We got to the very bottom of the hip hop conspiracy iceberg, the rap conspiracy iceberg. It's been a crazy, wild ride. I have learned some stuff that I never thought I would learn, stuff that I unfortunately can't unlearn, things that I never thought I would even hear suggested, some of the most ridiculous theories in history. I would just like to point out once again, as I did at the start, everything contained in this video is a conspiracy theory. It's nothing more than a theory. There is absolutely no proof to prove any of these theories on this list, a lot of this is hearsay and can be disproven as false. I mean, no disrespect to the people that I've mentioned in this video, mostly. And that was really just a look at every single rap conspiracy theory that exists so that we can get our head around what is really going on in these streets. What did you guys think? Did you enjoy this video? Did you enjoy a longer video, not on a story, but kind of on more general different topics? Let me know down in the comments. Let me know what your favorite rap conspiracy was. Let me know if you want me to do more kind of long videos like this in the future. And maybe I missed off a conspiracy that you know. If there's a conspiracy that you know of that didn't appear in this video, throw it down in the comments. Let me know what you think. Before we go, I just want to say a huge thank you to you for getting this far in the video. I doubt that many people got to this far in the video all the way to the end. So shout out you, you, you are a legend for sticking with me for this long. I also want to give a huge shout out to just everybody that subscribed to this channel. A massive shout out to all of my amazing patrons who you can see on the screen right here. If you want to get your name in the credits of the video, head on over to patreon.com slash Ross. You guys are legends for supporting the channel. I I appreciate you watching this video. And until next time, it's been your boy Trapmore Ross. I am outie baby. Oh, and follow me on Instagram at Trapmore Ross. Anyway, whatever. Peace. Bye.